Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and a big welcome to all attendees this afternoon to the World Bank Workshop on Battery Energy Storage in Southern Africa. This is the first energy storage workshop that I'm conducting virtually, and I confidently expect that there will be more. The subject of this webinar and workshop is Battery Storage Value Chain Creation in Southern Africa findings and perspectives. My name is Chris Yelland, Managing Director at EE Business Intelligence, and I will be your host and moderator at this workshop, signed in from Johannesburg. A big welcome to Mr. Frederick Vidal of the World Bank, based here in South Africa, who will be saying a few words of contextualization and opening the workshop. A big welcome to all our presenters and panelists today, all of whom will be introduced to you in due course. Of course, a big welcome uh, also to you, the attendees today, for your interest and participation in the workshop. A special welcome also to Dr. Rahul Walawalka, the founder, president and managing director of Customized Energy Solutions. Rahul is an old friend and colleague of mine who I hosted some 15 years ago when he and his wife Netra, who is also an electrical engineer, visited South Africa as young engineers after Rahul won a prize from the Institute of Engineering and Technology in the UK and his prize was to deliver a lecture all around the world, including South Africa. So these are good memories indeed, Rahul. So Rahul has been at the very forefront of advocating and developing the battery energy storage sector in India and globally all his career, when for most people, battery energy storage was a remote and distant concept. Rahul went on to establish and become president of the India Energy Storage Alliance and a leader at the Global Energy Storage Alliance. So South Africa has a lot to learn from Rahul and from customized energy solutions and from the, energy, from the India Energy Storage Alliance and its partners and sister associations around the world about becoming part of the massive growth in the battery energy storage value chain in our region here in Southern Africa, as well as on the continent of Africa. Battery storage technology provides business, manufacturing, job and development opportunities across the value chain in mining, industry, energy and transport. In the global economic recovery context, the challenge will be to provide the right incentives to scale up the battery storage value chain in Southern Africa and the continent. I will leave it to Frederick and Customized Energy Solutions to elaborate further on the purpose of this workshop today. Just under 1,500 delegates have registered to attend this workshop to hear what the World Bank, Customized Energy Solutions, MinTech, the Council for Scientific and Industrial Research, the Industrial Development Corporation, and the South African Energy Storage Association have to say on this subject. May I express a big thanks to Frederick Vidal and the World Bank for hosting this important workshop I'd like to also thank Customized Energy Solutions and their partners for the study which will be presented today and to all the presenters and panelists for their participation today and for the time and efforts that they've put in. Please do note that this webinar is being recorded and links to view the webinar on demand and to download all presentations will be made available shortly to all those who registered to attend as well as publicly. While the presentation is in progress, please do send your questions on the Q&A text facility. Questions should not be sent on the chat facility, but on the Q&A text facility. I will also be taking verbal questions from the media and from selected participants who may put up their hands to ask questions during the Q&A session later today. We've set aside half an hour after the presentations for our expert presenters and panelists to answer just some of your questions. 
Ladies and gentlemen, the subject matter of this, uh, this workshop uh, on battery energy storage for Southern Africa and for Africa is clearly a matter of huge interest as attendance at this webinar shows. So may I now hand over to Frederick Verdal, who is the senior power engineer working at the World Bank based in South Africa. Frederick is indeed the driving force behind this workshop. In his position at the World Bank, he is playing a critical role in developing the energy storage value chain in South Africa, in Southern Africa, and throughout the continent of Africa. So without further ado, I now hand over to Frederick for his introductory remarks. Fred, over to you now. Thank you. Thank you, Chris. And good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining and good morning for those uh, who are on the morning time zone. Um, well, uh, thanks, Chris, for this introduction. I will give a few words of background. Um, and uh, and then one, one thing that is uh, of importance for us for this, uh, for this workshop, uh, we want it to be interactive, to be a dialogue. Of course, there will be presentations from, from us and our consultants and the, and the panelists, but we would like to hear from you also. Um, so as of background, uh, well, this, this study on battery storage value chain uh, started actually, uh, uh, the genesis was in, in 2019, uh, when uh, the DMRE minister uh, put actually battery storage as a pillar of the, the World Bank uh, DMRE cooperation. Uh, and then uh, the minister designated very wisely uh, uh, Mintech as focal point on the battery storage, uh, because uh, the thinking was already on his mind to have uh, the value chain uh, as a key aspect of, of the whole uh, uh, topic. Um, and then Mintech, uh, I, I thank already Mintech for this, to dedicate a team and, 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 and time to, for us to, to, to cooperate and, and to move forward the study. Um, so it was a genesis. Uh, after that, of course, as Chris said, uh, the battery storage uh, program in, in ESCOM uh, was also one key aspect. The fact that the World Bank and other lenders uh, support this program uh, for it to, to demonstrate the, the value of uh, grid scale battery storage and, and to pave the way for more uh, battery storage uh, as we saw in the IRP, in the RMI4P. It, it was also one key aspect of, uh, of the, the thinking around this study. And, uh, and then, um, yeah, well, as, as ESCOM uh, CEO said uh, very rightly in, in, in his uh, lecture in, at the University of Pretoria, I think it was in August uh, this year, uh, that battery uh, uh, storage industrialization uh, should be a normal follow-up of all this uh, you know, trend and, 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 uh, and installation of batteries in South Africa and a natural segue with uh, what ESCOM is doing. Um, so all these were positive signals. We received those are positive signals after that down the road, you know, uh, from the presidency when, uh, when uh, um, uh, Ms. Uh, Makaya talked about battery storage as a center of uh, the economic recovery of the country. And then the study done by uh, DTIC on, uh, on lithium battery storage for electric vehicles and, and, and then IDC and, and C CSIR, uh, as you will hear today. So all this made, uh, made a, a strong case uh, to, to make this study uh, and to see what it would take actually to, to develop uh, the value chain on all segments and uh, also separately in every segment. Um, on the World Bank side, uh, of course, it was very timely uh, because the study is at crossroads of very uh, important World Bank initiatives uh, on climate smart mining first, uh, where uh, our extractive colleagues are, are looking at the way to, 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 to extract better, more minerals for, for clean energy on uh, the energy storage partnership that the World Bank launched uh, in 2018, uh, sort of think tanks that is uh, where, where a lot of entities of South Africa are already well represented. And then the, this, uh, this partnership has uh, its workshops this week. 
Um, and then on the on the value chains, uh, World Bank and IFC are cooperating on developing value chains of many uh, sectors. Uh, our last, uh, not the last one, but the one before in 2020, uh, World Development Report uh, on value chains is is worth looking at if you are interested in online. Um, and all this, of course. Uh, 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 brought us to, to, to engage discussions with, uh, with countries who would like to develop this value chain. Most of these countries are actually uh, mineral rich countries, uh, as we say. Um, and then uh, I'm happy to say that uh, from all these countries uh, in South Africa, we are the first ones to have a, a sort of integrated, inclusive uh, uh, overview study on this aspect. And then, uh, of course, the Latin America countries and others are watching us and, and would like to, to see what is our, our, our feedback from this study. So, so, so it's very good that, uh, that uh, um, South Africa uh, uh, is at the forefront of, of many topics uh, and, and not only on, on COVID tracking research, but on many other topics. Um, so yes, well, I will just just finish uh, this introduction by by saying that um, I, I am a, a huge fan of all the the, the webinars that uh, Mr. Yeland is organizing. Uh, I saw many of them on grid hydrogen. I would say just one thing: well, grid hydrogen is coming strong, uh, but battery storage is already there. Uh, meaning that we we are very close to 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 create something uh, substantial for the economy of of the country and very fast. Um, now we would like to to hear from you, uh, hear your views, suggestions, comments, complaints uh, about uh, what is not working. How can we uh, uh, work all together to 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 accelerate this development? Uh, so the, the study that will be presented to you is, is uh, in progress, so please be kind with us and then, uh, and then uh, your comments, of course, will enrich our work. So back to you, Chris, for the next steps. Yeah, thank you very much, Frederick. And uh, yeah, I think that was an interesting comment of yours. Hydrogen is really uh, an important thing, uh, but it's somewhat futuristic. Uh, but battery storage is already here and it's starting to make a major impact uh, around the world uh, and we should not forget this. So uh, I do not see these as competing technologies but complementary technologies uh, each with their own areas of application but certainly uh, battery storage is, is here right now. So it's now my pleasure to introduce you to the, uh, uh, the Customized Energy Solutions team uh, and their partners uh, who are here today, uh, all of them in the room. Not all of them will be speaking, but they're available as support and to answer your questions in the Q&A text uh, facility. Uh, and it's my pleasure, firstly, to introduce you to Harsh Thacker. Uh, Harsh has been involved in providing consulting and market research services to utilities, OEMs, regulation makers, and other clients of customized energy solutions and the India Energy Storage Alliance on energy storage, electric mobility, renewable energy, and other energy-related emerging markets and technologies. He holds an MBA from Leeds University Business School in the UK and a BTech in Electrical Engineering from the Vis Vesvaraya National Institute of Technology, India. He has had a short stint as a consulting intern with uh, social sector organizations in Johannesburg in 2012. So welcome back uh, to South Africa, Harsh, even if it's only uh, virtually. Uh, it's good to, to have you here. But I would also like to introduce you to uh, one of their partners, Dr. Oliver, Oliver Dam. Uh, Oliver is a partner at LHA Management Consultants, focusing on techno-economics, feasibility analysis, and business strategy development and innovation. He's conducted many assignments for private and listed companies, as well as public sector clients. And since 2014, Oliver is also a senior advisor in South Africa for the Fraunhofer Gesellschaft in Germany and an associate professor extraordinary in the industrial engineering department at Stellenbosch University. He holds a PhD in metallurgy and materials engineering 
from Wits University and a master's degree in engineering management from the University of Pretoria. So those are our two main presenters uh, that we have uh, here today, but they are supported uh, by the, the rest of the team. Uh, and if I may mention them by name, I won't read out their detailed CVs or introductions, but uh, we have Avantika Sastish from India, Elena Broughton, and Ralph Treble uh, are here in 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 the uh, in the room amongst our uh, presenters, and they'll be uh, supporting with answers uh, to the questions that you, the audience, uh, may wish to pose. So uh, it's now a great pleasure for me then to hand over to Harsh, who's going to uh, start and get the ball rolling. So over to you, Harsh. Thanks a lot, uh, Chris, for uh, providing this uh, platform to us. Uh, it's really great to. Uh, present this uh, study uh, to uh, the delegates and the attendees joining joining us here, and also a special uh, thank to Fred uh, Monil and uh, Nuan from World Bank team for uh, believing in us, in us to uh, conduct this study. Uh, so it it has been a, a great experience learning about the uh, battery uh, value chain uh, of South Africa, and we have uh, looked at this uh, uh, from from a different perspective. Uh, we have looked uh, at this market uh, uh, from the local uh, electric uh, mobility perspective, from uh, uh, behind the meter uh, uh, energy storage application perspective, and also from uh, front of the meter uh, application perspective. And we have also looked at uh, uh, different uh, components of battery value chain. Uh, I'll just uh, take, take you to the slides. So uh, today, the structure of uh, presentation uh, is uh, going to be divided in uh, three parts. So we will be looking at uh, uh, the demand analysis uh, and the opportunity identification, which has been done uh, for uh, South Africa uh, with respect to local and global uh, market. And then uh, based upon uh, this uh, background uh, market and opportunity, uh, we are looking at uh, uh, what can uh, South Africa achieve uh, with these scenarios uh, and we are going to look like what kind of impact it can provide uh, to the to the job market and also uh, to the gdp as a, as a whole uh, and we are also benchmarking some of the countries here uh, which have already uh, progressed into battery value chain are or progressing um, in in this sector so uh, we uh, most of you would have seen uh, some slides here or some market numbers here on uh, the global uh, advanced chemistry battery market. And uh, we also did some analysis here and uh, we have found that uh, uh, there is a huge opportunity uh, for a battery uh, value chain uh, to deliver to the global demand. So as per today, the demand is just under uh, 500 gigawatt hour uh, for the advanced chemistries and it's likely to cross a uh, thousand uh, by 2024, 2025. And in our estimation, um, the EV market would keep on growing very strong uh, throughout the globe and would uh, uh, go for, uh, uh, would uh, basically uh, lead for 2000 gigawatt hour of uh, demand globally. And uh, there would be uh, around uh, 200 to 300 uh, gigawatt hour demand uh, uh, between stationary uh, and uh, uh, other uh, applications which are like uh, uh, consumer electronics, power tools, and uh, those kind of uh, 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 applications. And uh, uh, to break up this demand, uh, uh, China is uh, looking at the manufacturing of over like a 1200 to 1500 gigawatt hour uh, by 2030. And uh, Europe is looking at a 600 uh, plus gigawatt hour by uh, 2030 uh, and uh, US is looking uh, uh, again over 500 uh, gigawatt hour by 2030. Uh, so that's uh, our uh, uh, kind of understanding uh, of this uh, overall global uh, market. And we have also done some analysis on uh, the local uh, South Africa and Southern Africa market. And uh, we are also uh, kind of trying to understand uh, where are the strong points for uh, battery value chain in South Africa and uh, with what kind of demand can the uh, manufacturing or the processing open up. So we, we have interacted uh, with many stakeholders here and I, I want to thank 
to all of them for uh, helping us uh, with the study. Uh, so we have reached out uh, uh, to the R&D groups, uh, uh, Mintex, CSIR, uh, they have been very helpful here. Uh, and even, even uh, the battery associations, uh, SAESA, AISA, uh, and the consultants like uh, Benchmark Mineral uh, you know, had, had helped us a lot. And uh, we have also taken opinion from mining company about their investments, about their understanding of the market, and also uh, the uh, bottom of the value chain, uh, the battery makers or system integrators, uh, like how, how they are finding the market and what are their uh, plans around this market. So uh, there has been a lot of uh, um, you know, primary uh, surveys and research uh, being conducted uh, around this, and uh, these have been ongoing. Uh, so uh, we, we are uh, getting a lot of uh, great insight about the market here. So, so far our finding has been uh, that there, there is a, a great uh, potential uh, uh, for uh, advanced storage or advanced chemistries uh, in South Africa. And uh, overall, the demand can reach up to 10 gigawatt, gigawatt hour by 2030. Uh, so, I mean, uh, just comparing with uh, the previous slide, this number, might look uh, slightly smaller to you, but uh, it, it's a significant uh, number uh, to do a lot of things uh, in, in a battery value chain. Um, so this demand, uh, as we see today, is uh, under a gigawatt hour in South Africa. And as you can see on the chart on the right, uh, the majority of demand today comes from behind the meter market, which means the majority of demand is coming uh, from telecom market, uh, from uninterrupted power supply, the UPS market, and uh, some of the uh, behind the meter solar plus battery uh, installation. Uh, now these markets are majorly driven by uh, the reliability issues uh, in the grid. And uh, as long as these issues uh, would be there, uh, we would be so seeing strong demand on this side uh, for advanced uh, chemistries. Uh, on, on the front of the meter side, we are seeing uh, uh, the demand uh, uh, is going to grow in the next uh, two, three years um, with uh, uh, a strong plan presented around IRP, uh, the restriction on uh, natural gas to be used as emergency power can, uh, can again uh, uh, bring some demand in, in uh, next uh, four to five years. And also the bid window five uh, uh, presents a great opportunity on the front of the meter sector. Uh, but having said that, even if we consider all, all these uh, uh, drivers in the market, uh, the front of the meter market, um, although it's, it's a significant for many of the battery chemistries, for long duration battery chemistries, uh, but when we see the demand as a whole in 2030, it's uh, just gonna present under 5% um, of, of the total share of our uh, advanced chemistries. So the, the bulk of the market uh, uh, potential which lies lies on the electric mobility side of things. And even if we consider uh, much lower penetration than the global penetrations, uh, we, we still would have almost 70% uh, of a battery demand coming from electric vehicle sector in South Africa uh, by 2030. And that's gonna uh, do the bulk of uh, uh, you know, kind of a value to uh, battery industry. So if we just break South Africa battery demand uh, chemistry uh, by chemistry, then uh, uh, lithium ion is gonna strongly pick up after 2022 uh, in this market, both with behind the meter and uh, uh, front of the meter applications. We also see a good opportunity for beryllium battery here uh, and other flow batteries uh, because a requirement for uh, long duration uh, storage uh, would, would uh, keep coming in as South Africa uh, goes for higher uh, renewable penetration. And uh, uh, we are not very confident about lead acid uh, battery grow, uh, growing on too strong. Uh, it's because uh, there are various limitations uh, for this chemistry in particularly in uh, many applications in South Africa market. So we, have, we are seeing on both telecom side and some of the rural uh, electrification uh, side in, in countries like Tanzania, Kenya, uh, uh, lithium ion and flow battery are, are making great inroads. And uh, if, if that trend continues and uh, the share for 
uh, let us say the uh, batteries would would be limited uh, in in uh, uh, the near future and also definitely in the in the long term. Uh, if we see uh, the chemistry split uh, for advanced uh, chemistries in in the global perspective, uh, then you you see uh, there there is a great demand for NMC five three two and six two two today, and uh, this this is majorly being driven uh, by uh, uh, car makers in China, uh, Europe, and uh, North America. Uh, we see uh, uh, high nickel batteries making inroads now and their share is, is going to uh, pick up uh, considerably uh, after 2024, 2025. A uh, lot of people were writing down uh, LFP, that LFP share would reduce, but uh, uh, for last couple of years, we are seeing uh, LFP is performing uh, really well in, in the car global car, car market. It's performing really well in uh, stationary storage market. A lot of imported cells, uh, which are coming to South Africa market today, a majority of them are LFP, uh, which are going for uh, backup uh, applications. So considering this kind of a split of chemistry, uh, we see uh, there, there is going to be almost uh, uh, 16 times uh, a more requirement for, for nickel uh, uh, with respect to today's demand. Uh, we also see uh, for graphite, uh, since uh, there is not a lot changing on the uh, uh, anode side, graphite is, demand is going to grow very strong. Uh, uh, with copper and aluminum, again, uh, we, we don't have any substitute on the foils. Uh, so on the current collector side, uh, we, we are going to see uh, a huge demand for aluminum and copper. So after aluminum, graphite and copper, uh, nickel would be the next metal, uh, which, which would have the most demand. And after that, uh, uh, we, we see manganese is, is going to pick up really, really well uh, because of a lot of uh, manganese uh, chemistries uh, like LMNO uh, likely to uh, uh, gain some share of LFP market uh, after 2025. And uh, then we are also seeing uh, uh, cobalt uh, uh, and uh, vanadium and uh, other metals also growing almost by 10 folds uh, to 12 folds uh, in this uh, decade. So that, that uh, presents uh, a lot of opportunities for uh, metal companies in uh, South Africa, especially manganese and vanadium, because uh, that there is a huge resource of uh, uh, these two metals in South Africa. But we also see there is going to be a great uh, benefication of opportunity around manganese and vanadium uh, in South Africa. Uh, this can also be done for uh, nickel and aluminum, uh, but then uh, we would need to rely on uh, uh, some uh, uh, like Southern Africa or African countries uh, to get access to more uh, nickel and aluminum resources. Uh, same goes with uh, lithium. Um, so lithium availability uh, uh, for battery grade uh, uh, mineral is, is very limited. Uh, so far, there have been some mines which have been uh, found around Zimbabwe in Zimbabwe. Uh, and if, if uh, South Africa can procure uh, spodumene from there, uh, there, there is a good chance of making lithium hydroxide and lithium carbonate uh, in uh, South Africa. Uh, and uh, uh, for graphite, uh, uh, there, there is an issue uh, with, with the synthetic graphite because it requires a lot of electricity. And if the electricity rates are high and uh, uh, there is not a provision for uninterrupted uh, provision of electricity for 30 days, uh, then uh, making synthetic graphite is, is a big challenge uh, uh, in, in the current scenario for South Africa. Although uh, there, there can be a, a, a kind of a opportunity around natural graphite uh, because uh, uh, Mozambique, Madagascar are having a good uh, uh, kind of reserves of uh, uh, natural graphite and with the uh, uh, right flaking and uh, benefication, uh, uh, this natural graphite can be uh, uh, kind of blended uh, for anode uh, in, in different uh, chemistries. So uh, that's the opportunity here on, on the metal side. On overall upstream, midstream and down, downstream side, uh, we, we uh, are breaking this up uh, 
the value chain. And we see uh, on upstream, there are a lot of opportunities in South Africa and Southern Africa, uh, because a lot of minerals like nickel, manganese, cobalt, uh, vanadium are present here. But that also brings opportunity uh, for making manganese sulfate, uh, nickel sulfate, and uh, there are companies uh, like uh, MMC, Takadu, already uh, getting getting there. So uh, it, it's not like companies are not doing it. So uh, it, it's the first step what uh, the South Africa can uh, get into. And uh, then uh, on the midstream side, uh, we, we see uh, making of aluminum foil, uh, vanadium electrolyte is, is very much feasible. Uh, there, there are some other aspects uh, which would require know-how of running plants and uh, uh, gaining some uh, technical assistance from uh, bigger uh, companies elsewhere. So midstream, uh, we feel we feel that uh, aluminum and vanadium electrolyte is, is very much doable. And on downstream, uh, although uh, the feasibility on battery cell manufacturing is low today, but if, if you look at the demand, uh, 2030 and beyond, uh, there, there would be uh, an opportunity to invest into uh, even battery cell manufacturing. And, and that's, that's uh, is what uh, uh, we would recommend in, in a, a base case or a, or a good case scenario, best case scenario. Uh, we already have a lot of companies uh, doing battery packs and uh, you know, we would talk about all these different opportunities and how this can impact uh, the GDP growth and the job opportunities in South Africa uh, in, in the next chapter. So I will request uh, uh, my colleague, Dr. Oliver uh, Dam, to uh, take us uh, forward uh, with the study. Over to you, Dr. Oliver. Thank you, Harsh, for those words. And if I can ask um, uh, Dr. Oliver to come in at this point uh, and continue this uh, presentation. Yes. Can you, uh, did, yeah. Thank you. That's perfect. We can see your presentation in full, full screen. All good. Thanks. Ex excellent. Thank you, Harsh. And uh, thank you, Chris, also for the introduction. <clears throat> so uh, as Harsh indicated, based on uh, the market analysis and value chain analysis that he presented, <clears throat> we looked at a number of different scenarios, uh, which can also be seen almost as a roadmap, um, if you like. Uh, where we start with a scenario called easy pickings, which essentially talks primarily to local battery mineral beneficiation and battery energy storage uh, system integration. And as he indicated, there are already activities in this regard in South Africa. Uh, bridging the divide, we would look at uh, expanding activities, uh, both in terms of the products, uh, more into the midstream area, um, of the value chain and specifically looking uh, to develop a regional battery minerals beneficiation hub uh, where one would uh, access raw materials from, uh, from other countries in Africa uh, to, to actually produce battery materials. Um, and also then a larger scale activity around battery energy storage systems uh, for front of meter and behind the meter applications. Uh, the whole nine yards would then essentially be uh, what Harsh also described would include uh, EV uh, battery assembly and potentially battery cell manufacturing. So essentially one would look towards developing an integrated battery value chain. Um, having said that, uh, that is probably a medium to longer term ambition um, and is contingent upon um, a whole number of issues uh, such as the migration of the local auto industry towards uh, initially export focused uh, EV production and the like. Um, so this would build essentially on, on the strengths, uh, the easy picking scenario would essentially uh, build on South Africa's strengths and we've uh, seen this already. Uh, so we have a large amount of manganese reserves, we have uh, good reserves of vanadium of course, um, and a number of other materials which are potentially relevant for, uh, for the battery uh, value chain. Um, also, we have already companies active in battery material or planning to get into battery material production. Uh, MMC, manganese metal company, is doing electrolytic manganese and are looking at uh, expanding into manganese sulfate. Uh, Takadu was mentioned, uh, who are start, have started uh, nickel sulfate production and also Bushfeld Minerals and Bushfeld Energy, of course, uh, is an emerging integrated vanadium electrolyte -like producer. 
Um, and similarly, we have uh, the technical capability essentially to produce aluminum foil uh, for the current collector of the cathode, uh, which can potentially um, be, uh, be expanded. Uh, a number of small companies, or relatively small companies, typically 30 to 60 people or so, are involved in battery pack development and assembly, uh, typically for stationary and selected industrial mobility applications. And what is interesting is that they all have uh, in their own intellectual property and competencies around uh, battery management systems, uh, design development, and particularly the software uh, associated with that. And they've also started to export uh, some of their products to uh, quite demanding uh, markets such as the uh, United States and, and Europe. In terms of the scale of the battery value chain, so we're looking here just to summarize what the activities are that we see. So on the upstream side, we mentioned nickel sulfate, manganese sulfate, vanadium pentoxide. Uh, going into vanadium electrolyte and aluminium foil as a midstream activity. And we see stationary base assembly and VRX. Um, that's the vanadium flow battery assembly um, uh, for export and for domestic uh, markets. And the kind of scale here is about six and a half billion rand, and the total direct and indirect jobs of about 26,000. Of course, it's not all uh, plain sailing, there are some challenges. and. Uh, certainly the constrained electricity supply and the, uh, the rising prices of electricity uh, is a challenge. Um, South Africa also has quite low grade manganese ores, while, while China has high grade carbonate ores, so that impacts on, uh, on, on feasibility. Um, nickel and cobalt are produced as byproducts of PGM mining and then hence are somewhat dependent on the PGM market. And they're also lower cost production of uh, class one nickel uh, from laterite ores. And there are a number of, of these issues here. Um, best manufacturer, the companies mentioned issues like lack of competitiveness of the local electronics industry, which is forcing them to uh, have their bases manufactured and uh, assembled in China, but to their own design. And also the ever popular one, access to competitive financing uh, is limiting their ability to expand and to achieve scale uh, rapidly. The next scenario bridging the divide would build on regional strengths and particularly our favorable geographic position relative to key battery materials like cobalt in the DRC, lithium and nickel in Zimbabwe, copper in Zambia, and graphite in Mozambique and Tanzania. Um, we have of course trade agreements. However, uh, a significant challenge is to be able to in fact access those raw materials at competitive prices because there are lots of existing supply agreements already in place, uh, particularly with China, but also with other uh, countries uh, in Europe and so on um, for, for supplying the materials or the raw materials into, into battery plants uh, abroad. Um, we have opportunities around the rapid growth in energy storage demand as harsh as indicated, and uh, we would expand the battery pack manufacturing industry for industrial and stationary energy storage systems for the local and export markets. So to look at this graphically, so here we have the phase one, if you like, or the easy picking scenario, and we're adding uh, some lithium hydroxide, NMC powder and spherical graphite. Uh, this would be primarily directed towards uh, global markets. And uh, in total, this kind of value chain would be approaching about 8 billion Rand and about 40, 41,000 direct and indirect jobs uh, over it in the 10 year period or in, in 10 years time. So I've mentioned some of the challenges, particularly the access to raw materials. And also there is uh, the issue of know-how in some of these materials like NMC cathodes in particular, that's not trivial processes. And so it would require technology partnerships. Um, the electricity supply constraints I've mentioned, there's very limited funding for R&D and for industry support uh, for the refining of these materials. And of course, we are not alone in this. Um, it's, it's, it's striking to see that most countries that are very active in uh, battery materials uh, or have lots of resources are in fact not active in the battery value chain typically. And of course, a number of those countries are, are looking to change that. Uh, best manufacturer, again, the competitive financing uh, is, is an issue and also lack of local battery pack testing and certification facilities was noted as an issue uh, by the industry. 
That brings us then to probably the preferred scenario, which is the whole nine yards, uh, which would essentially have the ambition to create an integrated battery value chain with some level of scale. And here, the key driver we see would be the automotive industry and the need essentially also from a strategic perspective to pivot that the local industry into EV manufacture. And as I said, initially for exports, um, if the industry is to survive, because uh, we are exporting more than 60% of our local production and more than 70% of that goes to Europe. And those markets are changing very rapidly towards uh, EVs. Um, also, we of course have within the current support system for the automotive industry, a, an ambition uh, to increase local content to 60%. And that would typically require that we should at least assemble uh, uh, EV battery packs and, and possibly go into, uh, into cell manufacture as well. And of course, we have a significant strength here because we have an existing automotive value chain uh, with the associated technologies and quality systems and the like. Uh, cell manufacture, we don't, do not have, of course, uh, established cell production, lithium-ion cell production in South Africa. Um, some local companies do have some experience abroad, such as Metair, and others have announced uh, some, uh, some, in some cases, very ambitious uh, plans to establish local manufacture. In our view, however, it's unlikely that those would be successful in establishing an independent manufacture for uh, for automotive OEMs at, at least. Um, so we see that should probably be uh, one or more uh, battery cell manufacturers that are already established from abroad. Um, so this is what the value chain would look like by adding, uh, by adding the EV battery pack assembly and cell manufacturing, both for local, but particularly for export. And so we would then be looking at a value chain of around 11 to 12 billion in the base case and maybe 58, 59,000 uh, direct and indirect jobs. Um, some of the challenges, of course, there is uh, South Africa in the international rankings uh, of global lithium battery supply chains. Um, we are ranking high in raw materials, unsurprisingly low in local battery demand and uh, very low or non-existent as far as the manufacturing is concerned. So clearly that is a view of the current situation. Um, some of the challenges also are there are high capital investment requirements into plants like this and the comparatively small scale, I mean, five to 10 gigawatt hours, that is probably the smallest commercially viable scale for a gigafactory at the moment. And, uh, and the trend is certainly towards larger gigafactories and that will continue until 2030. But nevertheless, five to 10 gigawatt hours is a very substantial amount in itself. Uh, it is very dependent, of course, the achievement of this very dependent on our OEMs, um, pivoting, as I said, into, into electric vehicles. And the sector is also typically very highly supported and incentivized in, the, in China, but also in Europe and the USA. And uh, Harsh will be talking a little bit more about that just now. So this is really the impact comparison uh, from the easy pickings through to the whole nine yards. So you can see how uh, the value chain would expand. And sorry, I'm trying to scroll down. My machine is refusing to scroll. Something is pausing. Are you not able to move to the next slide? Huh? Uh, 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 sorry, sorry. There we go. Uh, it's, ah, uh, it's fixed. It's fixed itself. My apologies for for that momentary blip. Um, we've also looked a little bit as to where the jobs could be created, just on the, from a direct perspective, and it's primarily in this region here, Kauteng, Northwest, and Kumalanga, but there are some scatterings elsewhere as well. And we've also looked at some skills requirements and the ability to address these, so I'm not going to go through this in great detail in the interest of time. Suffice to say uh, that there are various types of skills that will be required. Um, but that there will also be a requirement to, um, to establish particular skills training programs which are uh, focused towards uh, battery energy storage systems and battery materials and manufacturing technology. And with that, uh, over to you, Harsh. So uh, we'll, we'll just take a, also look at uh, how some of the global com uh, countries are developing their value chain. So 
uh, it has been noted that many uh, countries uh, like Indonesia, which is like uh, uh, doing great on, on uh, nickel side, uh, uh, the S South American countries, uh, which are having uh, great uh, uh, lithium resources, and Australia, Western mm -hmm. Australia to be precise, uh, is uh, uh, kind of uh, uh, supplying a lot of metals and minerals uh, to the battery industries, but we don't see a significant participation uh, from from them on on the beneficiation side on uh, material processing side uh, the only uh, notable uh, uh, different difference here uh, would be China uh, so that that's a, that's a different example there uh, where where the market a big market exists uh, manufacturing exists and also uh, mining uh, is is uh, uh, being done for different uh, metals. Uh, so we would take a look at uh, uh, also both the leading uh, countries here and uh, the emerging countries, uh, like how they are, they are doing it. But uh, we, we still see, even for markets like uh, USA and uh, Europe, they are still figuring out uh, what would be the best way uh, to support industry around uh, development of the value chain. Uh, because we, we have seen uh, the notable companies like uh, Johnson, Methe, uh, and others are finding it difficult uh, to establish as a, a battery raw material uh, processor. Uh, and uh, it, it would be uh, good to uh, take some learnings from these uh, companies and markets. Uh, just trying to go to the next slide. Uh, it's just hanging here. Yeah. So, uh, it would be interesting to see how India and uh, uh, Thailand are developing around uh, manufacturing of uh, battery uh, ecosystem and uh, also the EV ecosystem. Uh, so for Thailand, uh, under the Thailand Board of Investment, uh, they have uh, uh, come out with a 1.1 billion package uh, and it's uh, uh, tailored for a growth of 30% EV penetration by 2030. Um, and uh, there is an estimated demand of uh, 20 gigawatt hour coming by 2025, uh, or at least the manufacturing of 20 gigawatt hour coming by 2025. Uh, so the major benefit here um, given by Thailand is a three years uh, tax holiday uh, and a eight years uh, corporate uh, tax exemption. Uh, and uh, import uh, duty reduction on major uh, raw material and components, uh, which would help uh, making batteries and cells locally. Uh, they are also helping with uh, 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 reimbursements or benefits around uh, training of employees and uh, training of R&D team around uh, this uh, uh, cell manufacturing and EV assembling. Uh, for India, uh, they have come up with a program called Advanced Chemistry Cell Production Linked Incentive. So the budget outlay for this uh, scheme is uh, 2.5 billion and uh, it's a production linked incentive. So uh, the companies which will qualify for the scheme uh, would be getting uh, incentives or subsidies against the production they do for the first five years of production. And uh, the subsidy would be linked to 20% uh, at max 20% of the sell price. Um, and uh, the condition uh, which this uh, uh, advanced uh, chemistry cell production linked incentive puts uh, is to uh, have a value add of 60% uh, for sell uh, locally. Uh, so that, that's a big task, uh, uh, which, uh, which many companies think uh, is impossible or very difficult if uh, the minerals are not uh, mined in in, a, in the particular country. Uh, similarly, UK has also asked for a similar local value addition um, of 60% uh, for the plants uh, which would be coming in, in UK. Uh, so that, that's the program run by uh, these two emerging countries. Uh, if you look at uh, comparison of these emerging countries with uh, markets like China, Europe, and United States, then there are a lot of more benefits uh, in this market. 
So China came up with a strategic uh, vision document uh, called Made in China 2025, under which uh, they uh, said like there is a 67 uh, billion uh, uh, budget outlay uh, for uh, 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 10 sectors mm -hmm. each. So there, there is a total budget outlay of 672 uh, billions for uh, key 10 sectors, uh, uh, out of which one sector is the new energy sector and battery uh, is, is part of it. So uh, China is uh, uh, kind of targeting over 1200 gigawatt hour of uh, uh, battery production uh, cell and cell production by 2030. Uh, it's uh, the largest uh, uh, target any uh, uh, country is, is having. And uh, the relief here uh, is majorly given now towards R&D uh, facilities and uh, uh, kind of creating a, a national integrated circuit fund uh, of 21 billion, uh, which would help in uh, creating uh, local IPs and uh, uh, helping companies uh, to develop their own uh, uh, niche in uh, cell chemistries and battery chemistries. On the other hand side, the uh, United States is providing a lot of uh, capital incentives for plants uh, in, in different areas. Some of these incentives are uh, state specific. Uh, in US uh, too, there is a, a good subsidy and grants provided for uh, development of batteries. Uh, so that's, that's a, a major benefit uh, which was given in United States so far. Uh, but the national blueprint for lithium batteries, which was released this year, uh, says that uh, they want to develop a, a, a complete value chain, uh, right from uh, mineral beneficiation, mining to uh, recycling. And there would be incentives given to uh, companies investing uh, in, in these parts of uh, value chain. However, a budget outlay has not been uh, uh, kind of specified there. Uh, and in, in EU, uh, there has been a scheme called Important Projects of Common European Interest, under which uh, there were two uh, budget outlays uh, released in 2019 and 2021, each around uh, three, uh, uh, b uh, three billion uh, uh, euro dollars. And uh, they have uh, uh, partnered with over uh, seven countries there uh, and many industries in those countries and each has been provided uh, a different kind of benefit on R&D, uh, uh, development of workforce and uh, uh, providing them access to uh, raw material. So these are the kind of helps which have, which have been provided uh, in, in European market. Now this is the additional subsidy which is provided um, uh, on like top of case-to-case uh, -case subsidy provided to an individual plant. Mm -hmm. And in United States and Europe, uh, a 10 gigawatt hour plant is almost kind of getting uh, uh, benefits of uh, uh, half a billion or 1 billion uh, uh, subsidies through tax, uh, through land, and uh, different kind of benefits are, are being given uh, there. So, uh, on, on the state sides too, uh, we, we see a lot of the uh, benefits are being given. In uh, US, it's uh, mostly in terms of CAPEX subsidy and also tax exemptions uh, are being provided uh, by uh, all of these states like California, Tennessee, Texas. Uh, and uh, there have been budget outlays provided in Tennessee for, for this battery industry. There, there is also uh, subsidy, uh, subsidy provided on hiring of resources and training of resources. Uh, and similarly, uh, for states in India, we see um, uh, a cap capital subsidy uh, provided uh, in tune of 10 to 20 percent for different uh, cell manufacturing plant. And there is a land subsidy of almost 50 uh, percent provided. Uh, there is a good uh, electricity rate provided, uh, the duty is exemption on the electricity rate uh, because uh, uh, a cell manufacturing plant, uh, like a one gigawatt hour cell manufacturing plant, almost takes a 40 to 50 uh, gig gigawatt hour of uh, uh, electricity uh, in, in a year. So uh, electricity, again, uh, would, would be a good requirement uh, for this industry. 
so uh, seeing what what these countries are doing uh, and how uh, they are going about their program uh, so it's very clear uh, that if south africa has to invest in battery value chain uh, it cannot just happen uh, in in a silo uh, way uh, the the investment also needs to happen on the ev value chain and local ev manufacturing uh, because that's going to drive a demand for uh, uh, majority of uh, uh, like this advanced chemistries uh, in future and uh, even our estimate shows that 70% of uh, demand for batteries in south africa by 2030 can come from uh, electric vehicle industries so just like thailand is doing uh, they have uh, kept this program integrated uh, so it's it's very important to uh, uh, integrate both both these sectors um, and what kind of budget outlay uh, can be required? So both by th uh, with Thailand and India, we have seen the minimum that uh, government is spending is in tune of one to three billion uh, to help these industries grow at 20 to 50 gigawatt hour level. So even if South Africa is looking at a number like a 10 to 20 gigawatt hour level after 2030, then the support uh, would be required. And the later you go to market, the later the plants come, uh, the economies or scales are going to get bigger and bigger. And uh, probably in a 2035 scenario, uh, maybe a five gigawatt, gigawatt hour plant cannot, cannot be economically uh, sustainable. So uh, those kind of uh, things would need to be considered uh, while, while creating a plan uh, for a gigafactory, gigafactory in South Africa. Um, and a uh, uh, lot of uh, climate funding opportunities are available uh, for uh, helping these value chain grows. So a uh, lot of countries like India, China have tapped into this kind of a funding. And I'm sure uh, Fred and the rest of the World, World Bank team uh, can help uh, South Africa with the same. Uh, and also uh, for South Africa, uh, there can be a huge relief in terms of uh, uh, import bill of uh, uh, oil import bills. Uh, you know, because if EV is coming, there, there would be a great reduction uh, there. And uh, uh, for EVs also, we have seen a similar uh, budget of one to three billion being spent uh, by countries like uh, Thailand and India to uh, develop an EV ecosystem. Uh, so yes, uh, it, it's going to be a costly program uh, to run, but uh, this, this is a sunrise sector and it, it provides a great opportunity for South Africa uh, to get into uh, a phase of industrialization. Uh, and uh, since uh, many of uh, the countries are banning uh, diesel engines uh, of different sizes uh, for different vehicles, uh, and South Africa is, is, is a big in, uh, exporter of uh, cars uh, and different uh, automobile vehicles. So it's very important uh, to have a smooth transition for the auto industry uh, in, in South Africa and, and to have a, a comfortable EV target for them uh, so that in industry is, is not kind of penalized for this uh, transformation. Uh, so th those are our thoughts. Uh, thank you so much uh, uh, for listening to our presentation. Uh, we are happy to take uh, uh, the question, questions and answers. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Harsh, um, for that insight and for the fantastic work uh, that uh, Customized Energy Solution has done in this study for the World Bank. Uh, the work is not completed yet, ladies and gentlemen. You've seen some slides here today. Uh, I can assure you that this is just a small part of the slide pack uh, that uh, Harsh uh, and, and, and uh, Oliver have prepared uh, for us. Uh, the full slide pack will be shared with everybody uh, who has registered to attend this event. Uh, and, uh, and, and this workshop today, in fact, is going to be a further input into the work that has been done uh, by uh, CES in order for them to, uh, to complete their study. So it's now my job to do a little bit of interactive um, work and to get your opinion as the audience. Uh, and as I mentioned, we're gonna conduct two polls. The first one is gonna be done now and the second one is gonna be done a little later. And in each of these polls, there are two questions that are being asked. They are very easy questions. Uh, and your answers are going to be uh, required for you to uh, complete on this uh, form, which you will see simply by ticking some tick boxes. Now, you may tick one 
uh, or you may tick several uh, answers. Uh, so I'm going to bring up onto your screens, hopefully, uh, the first poll. Uh, bear with me. So I, I, I hope you can now see this. Uh, this is the first poll, poll number one. And there are two questions for which there are a multiple choice answers. So the first question is as follows. Which segments of the battery storage value chain are you most interested in? So this is uh, up to you as, as, as individuals. So please, can you tick those ones that you are most interested in? Uh, of course, you could tick them all. Uh, but I hope you would tick the ones that you are most interested in uh, and, and uh, let us see what the reaction is from the audience. So I see a lot of uh, responses are coming in right now, thick and fast. Uh, and uh, we can see online, uh, I can see, I hope you can see as well, uh, that the, 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 the interests that are being uh, entered by the audience uh, are being tracked and the graph is being displayed. And you can see now there's something like 115, 17, 120 responses coming in thick and fast right now. And this is going to give us an idea of what you, the South African uh, audience that is interested in, in battery energy storage, what are your interests? Where do your interests lie? Do they lie in minerals and extraction? Do they rely, uh, 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 are your interests in materials and assembly? or in battery manufacture for utility scale and residential, or for mobile storage uh, industry, uh, in other words, electric vehicles, or R&D and engineering, R&D and engineering, or in operation and maintenance, or in recycling and reuse. Okay, so I see now that something like close on 300 responses uh, have been received. Uh, they're still coming in thick and fast. Please keep it up. Uh, and it seems that most people are interested in battery manufacture for utility scale, residential and commercial application. Uh, interesting, uh, but still, you know, data is still coming in, although it's slowing down a bit now. We've had 316, 317 responses. Those who have finished uh, with the question number one may go on to question number two. I see a lot of people have already gone on to question number two. Question number two is what segments of the battery storage value chain should South Africa be focusing? So this is not about your personal interest, uh, but about what is best for South Africa Incorporated. Where should we be uh, uh, focusing on as a priority? And again, it's a multiple choice question. You can uh, answer more than one by ticking more than one, but I, I hope you would focus on uh, the ones that uh, should be a priority for South Africa. Where should be the priority? And I can see that we've had about 300 and uh, what's it, 340 responses. So that's looking good. Uh, let me just go back to the first question to see how we're doing there. We've had about 348 responses. It is definitely slowing down now. So I think in shortly we're going to call an end to this poll. But please, if you haven't uh, done the poll, quickly just tick the boxes that you think uh, answer your questions best. Uh, we are monitoring this uh, and uh, we will, of course, make this information available to everybody uh, after the webinar, you know, report backs after this workshop. But this is a chance for you to engage and give us some feedback uh, because we want this to be an interactive workshop uh, and, and your, the results of what you indicate are going to form part of the work that is done by Customized Energy Solutions and their partners. So, ladies and gentlemen, I think we've kind of uh, reached the end of this poll. We've had 366 responses uh, to the first one uh, for, the, for the second question. And 300. Okay, so a good response. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. I'm going to now close this poll, even though maybe one or two haven't responded yet, but I think we've got a significant enough response to be statistically meaningful. So I'm ending the poll now and we'd like to thank you uh, for this. Um, I'm wondering whether I can share this results. Yeah, there's the results. Uh, we will, of course, uh, get this uh, to you, you know, in, in, a, in, a, in a documentary form. But there you can see the results of poll number one. Uh, which I think is going to be quite interesting. We're going to have to analyze it a bit more 
to, to really understand it. There's the, uh, the results for poll number two, uh, like a strong interest in mineral extraction for South Africa, strong uh, feeling that battery manufacture at utility scale and residential is important. Uh, lesser importance uh, seems to be mobile energy storage. Strange that because the mobile market seems to be so much bigger, but uh, these are your results, not mine. Uh, so really interesting results. I'm going to stop sharing the results and I'm going to close this uh, polls for the moment. And uh, I'm now looking at the time and it's six minutes past uh, one. We're a little bit over time, uh, but I'm going to call a comfort break now for nine minutes and ask you to please reconvene at quarter past one. That is 1315. So it's a nine minute comfort break. Uh, where uh, you can uh, stretch your legs and uh, relax a little bit, maybe grab a cup of coffee. Uh, thanks for your attention. It's been absolutely fascinating, the work done by CES and their partners. And we're going to reconvene at 13.15, where we will uh, have some really interesting uh, panelists uh, making pr uh, short presentations, uh, followed by a Q&A open discussion with you, the audience, with the uh, panelists uh, here and with the presenters, we have assembled a very powerful team, local and international, who will be able to answer your questions. So with that, I'm going to say uh, thank you. And, and uh, the, the comfort break is uh, now uh, in progress. And Ian, if you could kindly put on the slide. Thank you very much. We'll reconvene now at 13.15. Uh, that's in about seven minutes time, I think eight minutes time. Thank you.
Well, uh, ladies and gentlemen, according to my clock, it is exactly, uh, well, a few seconds after uh, 1.15, that's 13.15. So we're going to restart this uh, webinar, uh, this workshop, shall I say. Uh, and it's my pleasure to now introduce you to our panelists, a really esteemed uh, group of panelists uh, who I may uh, mention. Uh, Dr. Malefi Motuku, he's the CEO of Mintech. Uh, we have Dr. Mkulu Mate, he's the Chief Researcher and Program Manager of the Living Energy uh, Lab platform at the CSIR Energy Center. We have uh, Faisal Musa, who's an executive a divisional executive at the IDC, the Industrial Development Corporation. And lastly, we have Mikhail Nikoramarov, uh, who is the chairman of the South African Energy Storage Association. And he's also, by the way, uh, the, the CEO uh, and, and founder, I think, of, of Bushfelt Energy, a, a company uh, uh, you know, heavily involved in the vanadium um, mining business and as well as the uh, the whole vanadium value chain, uh, including uh, uh, vanadium flow batteries. So great pleasure to have with us some real experts here. Now, look, I could uh, spend some time in reading through their CVs, but I think I'm going to uh, skip that because after this uh, webinar, you will get a report back, which would in, which will include the, um, the the bios, the the the, the biographies, the introductory uh, details of all of these panelists. Uh, and I can assure you they are uh, leaders uh, of the highest caliber and stature in the South African uh, uh, energy sector, uh, in the science and technology sector. Uh, and it's really an honor to start off uh, with uh, Dr. Malefi Motoku, uh, who is the Chief Executive Officer of Mintech, who really are a key player. Uh, in this uh, study, uh, they are, you can say, have been appointed by the Department of Rural Resources and Energy to play the lead role uh, in this uh, creation of a battery energy storage value chain in South Africa. And to have Dr. Malefi Motuku, uh, you know, uh, speak to us today is a real honor. So without further ado, uh, 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 Malefi, would you like to uh, switch on your microphone and your camera? And uh, I'm not sure if you have any slides to share, but if you have, please share them. Otherwise, uh, please, can you um, uh, state your opening words? Thank you, uh, Chris. I have a, a presentation. I will not go through all the slides. Uh, uh, I will just focus on key areas. I've been following the questions so that I can just maybe give more information on one or two areas. Uh, the first that I'd like to, just a minute. If you look at the, the key drivers and needs, uh, uh, these have been uh, articulated uh, in the past uh, two presentations. So I'll just give effect to what South Africa has been doing by just highlighting a few key initiatives, uh, both uh, in partnership with uh, the private sector some supported by government, and to indicate that there are opportunities for us to, to grow this sector, and most importantly, to work with the private sector. This has been indicated before, uh, the key drivers and the needs, some of them are technical in nature, some of them are policy incentive programs that are required, but we've seen uh, the drive towards the uh, localization of the battery value chain. We've seen this in several countries. South Africa is not uh, immune to that, but what is coming out also very strongly is the need for high purity precursor materials. And the question is how are we responding to this in South Africa? I cannot overemphasize the need for research, development and innovation, policy directive, as well as uh, public-private uh, partnerships. Now, just briefly, where we are in South Africa, you have seen this before. A key elements, uh, phlospa, manganese, vanadium, titanium, nickel, phosphate. But I like to just, look, just briefly to add rare earth elements. And, and I'll talk to that uh, briefly. But uh, the overriding uh, requirement here is the need for exceptional purity when it comes to these uh, precursor metals. In, term, in terms of Mintech, our contribution, our core capabilities, mineral processing, hydrometallurgical, 
biometallurgical and pyrometallurgical capabilities in the form of uh, pilot plants, but also have been developing technologies specifically on the processing of uh, precursor materials. Where does MinTech play? Uh, strongly, we are in uh, extraction processes, and uh, we do work with pretty much all uh, minerals, but uh, in this case, uh, these are battery uh, minerals, battery grade uh, precursors, working with industry, developing specific flushes for them, but also playing in the recycling space. And I'll give uh, 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 an example of what we do in that space. Now, briefly, just to indicate what has been done by Mintech, by support from government, there was a study, somebody referred to this study on the technology landscape report and business case for the recycling of lithium ion batteries in South Africa. This was conducted by Mintech. And the, the challenge here is to get the fit material, is the quantities. And uh, as a result of that, we need to do more. So the biggest driver here that we see for the establishment of such a facility will be the anticipated growth in the electric vehicle market. Probably we can do better with education and some policy uh, directives in terms of recycling. And I've seen a question that uh, spoke to recycling specifically for lithium ion batteries. And I think it was nickel indicated there. What do we do at Mintech in terms of supporting technological development? We do process research. We have a piloting uh, facilities and we provide support for pre-feasibility studies. We have demonstration plans where we also support the bankable feasibility studies. But important for us is to work with industry to understand their specifications and develop the flow sheets specifically for those uh, materials. Quickly, on our fuel cell, and this is a, a program that is supported by Department of Science and Innovation. At, uh, at Minter currently, we have been working with industry, mining houses, Impala in particular. Where we are, 2021, we have a catalyst plant where we produce one kilogram batches. The target now for 2023 is to build a 10 kilogram batch manufacturing, catalyst manufacturing facility and move slowly to MEAs and commercial MEAs 2028 20, and to partner with industry for commercial fuel cell system manufacturing. I've indicated that we have worked with uh, Impala uh, supplying platinum where we are producing one kilogram batch catalyst that are incorporated in several of the fuel cells that are manufactured locally and some have been uh, tried uh, internationally. Where we are now is to build a five to 10 kilogram batch uh, catalyst manufacturing facility if the demand is there to move to 50 kilogram batch commercial scale facility. Quickly now, I've had a question about the vanadium. Well, we all know uh, the Bushnell complex and this is the yellow that I'm indicating in my presentation. The red, this is where an area where we get vanadium, titanium, and iron in the form of magnetite. And this is the area where most companies are mining vanadium. The problem is, at the moment, we don't have a demonstrated and proven economic process for the core extraction of vanadium, titanium, and or as sellable products. Currently, most people cherry pick uh, the vanadium and leave uh, titanium and sometimes even iron ore. So at Mintech, where, where we are, in partnership with government, we're investing significantly on the uh, construction of a world-class facility, both in terms of AC and DC arc furnace technology, to be able to demonstrate the core extraction of titanium, vanadium, and iron ore. We are at the construction phase where we're investing more than 150 million on the state of the art facility. We're looking for partners. We're looking to, to test your ores to be able to do that. I saw Bushfeld uh, Minerals there. Uh, we've been engaging with them and we invite you more to work with this, uh, the IDC. In terms of uh, uh, rare earth, we all know that uh, we do have uh, uh, deposits 
But currently, you don't have a lot of world-class deposits. World-class deposits, for example, by you know, uh, Obo in China. So if you look at Southern Africa, we don't have significant deposit uh, to really support the global competitive $500 million processing and separation plan. So what we have done at uh, Mintec was to treat most of uh, the ore ores from Southern Africa to demonstrate that uh, we can have a centralized refining facility. We have done that, we have de demonstrated that uh, we are able in South Africa in a centralized facility to treat the different ores. We are in a construction demonstration plant that we like to build, we need partners and uh, funding required, but we do have a demonstration plant. And uh, we have our own technologies there in the form of high temperature technologies, hydrometallurgical separation technologies. In terms of what is happening uh, on battery materials, we are working with SAIMM in organizing the conference uh, next year on battery materials. We're inviting a lot of people who are in attendance today to really attend it. We were given a short time, but I just wanted to give a flavor that uh, South Africa, it is investing in this area. Of course, we can do better. Battery minerals are important to Mintech, are important to South Africa. We do have a piloting capabilities and key recycling initiatives to support the development of segments of the battery value chain. This study is very timely for all of us. Uh, for what we are discussing today, uh, it will provide insights on South African uh, battery market prospects and the, the timelines here were talking about 2030, types of jobs that, and the numbers that could be uh, created and uh, skills in the battery value chain and possible scenarios for South Africa. The study for us uh, will really benefit Mintech in terms of uh, its work on energy storage minerals and most importantly, assisting South Africa to outline an implementation plan in the energy storage sector. The work that is supported by World Bank and the partnership with Mintech, we'd like to acknowledge that, but also the support uh, from the department who have indicated that uh, the key for us is to advance industrialization of all segments of the battery value chain and uh, acknowledge their support there. Thank you, uh, Chris. Well, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Molefi, for those words. Uh, and it's great to see uh, the work that you and uh, Mintech and the DMRE uh, are putting into uh, what I call the green minerals uh, value chain. Uh, the new minerals, uh, the minerals that are going to be needed uh, for the green economy uh, going forward. So thank you very much uh, for your input there and for the work that Mintech is doing in, uh, in, in commissioning this study uh, by, um, uh, through the World Bank uh, uh, to, to customize energy solutions. So our next uh, presenter or, or, or panelist uh, who's going to say an opening statement is Dr. Mkulu Mathe. And as I mentioned, uh, uh, Dr. Mkulu is the chief researcher and program manager uh, of the Living Energy Lab platform at the CSIR Energy Center. Great to have you here, uh, Mkulu. And the floor is yours now. Thanks a lot, uh, Chris. And uh, thanks to the colleague. Is my, are my slides visible? Uh, not yet, uh, but uh, could you uh, share your slide and also switch on your mic? Uh, your camera would be uh, nice to see you, uh, if that's possible. <laughs> OK, so I see your cameras come on, Mkulu but we haven't seen your slides shared yet. Ah, they seem to be coming on now. If you can put it into uh, presentation mode by double clicking that very button. Thank, thank you. you. Uh, again, thank you for the opportunity to participate in this uh, important uh, gathering. I think uh, I'll start by saying I was inspired by this uh, heading or headline that no country can control the entire critical mineral value chain as I was reading about uh, these value chains. I'm going to talk about uh, four things and then uh, conclude in the interest of time. I think here we can see 
on the bottom corner where my cursor is, you have South Africa and then you have Egypt. So this is uh, R&D spent per GDP. And we know for the longest time in South Africa, conversation has been, what will it mean or how do we cross the threshold of 1% GDP spent? But also on the line of uh, researchers per million of a population, we can see that uh, there are still challenges that we are not having that critical mass, which goes to the next slide. So when we are looking at uh, the share of the world population with access to electricity in 2019, Tunisia and uh, Egypt are the only two countries that are at 100%. And you can see that uh, we do have countries under 10%. So what we are talking about is that uh, over 640 million Africans have no access to energy. And that corresponds to an electricity access rate of African countries just over 40%, which is the lowest in the world. So we do have at CSIR uh, a new uh, activity initiative with regards to creation of an energy storage test bed. The importance of uh, the test bed is that uh, they tell us things we want to know about cells, modules, and batteries. But if you're looking at this uh, spider web diagram, you can see that uh, blue represents the desired performance and red is uh, the actual measured performance. So where red is not matching the blue cycle, you can see that uh, there are a lot of growth opportunities. But uh, on the right, if you look at uh, the battery calendar life, you can see that operating batteries at uh, the higher temperature is going to reduce uh, their uh, life. So it becomes important that uh, we understand the role of temperature into the life of the batteries that uh, we are going to be making. This is my last slide. And I thought that, uh, how do we bring together research scientists and industry partners on projects with commercial potential? And I have five bullets there. The first one is creating new knowledge, tools, and insights. So we have to acknowledge and embrace the role of fundamental research, which will enable us to develop technologies that enable energy storage at grip level. But then uh, we have been talking about facilities from uh, the study to what Mulifi talked about. So when we are talking about next generation facilities, can we have top end facilities that then position Africa as a global science leader? And uh, all this that we are talking about points to what is our cohesive strategy so maybe the question is, uh, as I have indicated, that there are opportunities for the 640 million people that don't have access. What becomes the cohesive strategy for electrification and energy storage across Africa? But more importantly, how do we get right people around the table? And these people need to have unique ability to collaborate with competitors researchers and through the different sectors of uh, their involvement. Then the point of collaborative research and development of projects, it's a question of funding. How do we fund? And uh, how do we have this collaborative research and innovation uh, projects? And then uh, on the question of uh, focus, how do we develop new and improved battery technologies with increased performance, lower cost, and considering the battery end of life as we have heard about uh, recycling? More importantly, battery industrialization center. How do we augment our effort in investing in a facility to support and create companies such companies that will quickly develop their capabilities to manufacture batteries, scale up and expand into global markets. Thank you for the opportunity. Thank you, uh, um, um, Kuru. And I, I 
think that you pointed out uh, in my mind you know some fantastic regional opportunities and not only regional opportunities but continental opportunities because uh, we may even have the opportunity to leapfrog certain uh, technologies uh, in, 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 in the centralized uh, generation and uh, extensive grid and move to distributed uh, uh, generation uh, in, in, in renewable energies and uh, energy storage, uh, you know, at, at a, at a, in a way that enables us to leapfrog these very old and expensive technologies uh, that um, may be problematic uh, going forward in Africa. So I, I do agree with you that there are immense opportunities out there if we can harness our abilities to collaborate across the continent. Uh, and, and of course, that takes money. But uh, now I, I would like to bring in uh, Faisal Musa, uh, who is the executive, uh, a divisional executive at the IDC. Uh, good to have somebody to talk about the money because um, Mkulu has just indicated that this is going to cost money. So to have somebody, uh, you know, uh, you know, at the IDC, uh, an organization that's been involved, you know, in, in, in the uh, initial setting up of places like Sassel, uh, in the, the whole industrial ecosystem of South Africa, and uh, also now moving into the green uh, hydrogen world. Uh, but we're really interested to hear what you have to say about uh, the financing uh, and making money available for our ambitions in this energy storage market. So over to you, Faisal. Uh, thank you, Chris. Uh, I wonder if you were involved in underlining how do we fund <laughs> in Dr. Marty's presentation. Um, it, it's quite a pleasure to see the outcomes of the research and thank you very much for inviting us to participate on the panel. I am actually quite excited. It does take uh, what we've done previously to another level and I'm very keen to look at the cooperation opportunities moving forward. Just to introduce um, who, uh, which unit I represent at the IDC. Uh, we've recently established a new unit called Industry Planning and Project Development. Uh, what this has done is it's amalgamated a lot of the disparate um, industry uh, development initiatives across the IDC and pulled it into one unit and staffed up the unit. And I recently joined the IDC to, to act as divisional executive of the team. Uh, we do two things. One is we do get involved in uh, planning both uh, current industries. So we're involved in sectoral master plans and then new industries. The two that are important for this conversation, of course, are uh, the battery value chain. And in my view, and as mentioned earlier, the automotive value chain. Uh, in terms of industry planning, uh, around 2016, we were instrumental in setting up the Energy Storage Industry St Steering Committee. It composed of a whole lot of parties, the Wind Energy Association, PV Association, Sanedi, CSIR, uh, lots of different parties. And it ran up until about 2019, uh, where it was disbanded after the, the formation of the South African Energy Storage Association. Uh, so we have seen a lot of the outcomes from those processes. Um, in terms of uh, project development, before I, I tell you what, what we are doing and what has informed what we are doing, I think it's important to, to talk about the funding component. Uh, and how we can contribute to funding. So our explicit role at this point in time is to look at projects that will move industry forward for South Africa and will move industrialization. We do have a particular lens through which we look at it, uh, profitability being one of it, but also localization, uh, the promotion of black industrialists, uh, getting um, a special economic zone supported so that we have uh, industrial activity across the country uh, and of course job creation. Um, I think the one thing uh, that is important within this, uh, this discussion is that we're all familiar with the fact that South Africa has a comparative advantage because we've got a lot of the, a lot of the minerals in the battery value chain. I don't see enough work being done on competitive advantage. And, and I'm hoping that post this, we would do a bit more work together on that. 
outside of looking at tax subsidies, uh, incentivization, et cetera. So I, I do think that would be a nice avenue for discussion and maybe a little bit of research uh, moving forward. What have we done to date? Um, around 2017, uh, there was a, a USTDA funded study which was completed. And I think uh, the entire steering committee was involved in, in that study. And we ended up focusing uh, on two value chains. One is the lithium iron value chain, which uh, resulted in a focus over these past few years on our part on manganese, cobalt, nickel, and lithium, and a specific focus on uh, precursor and cathode materials. Uh, the second thing that emerged from that study was a focus on the entire uh, vanadium redox flow battery value chain. And uh, of course, it's, it's great to see Bushveld Energy here. Um, I understand we've been doing a lot of work with them. Um, and, and that has been a focus for us um, over the past few years. Uh, of course, it builds on South Africa's uh, manganese ore reserves, you know, where we have vanadium deposits, et cetera. And I don't need to speak too much about that. Uh, we are also uh, quite keen to partner with other African and Sub-Saharan African countries, as we know that the minerals uh, base is, is very strong in Africa. I think the one thing I just want to highlight, uh, we are very involved in the automotive value chain in various capacities. Uh, we are funding a number of initiatives within that value chain, uh, both from the project development side and through our strategic business units on the debt side. And so uh, we do think that the linkages are, are very important there. Um, so very quickly, what are we doing? Uh, we may end up participating in the ESCOM Energy Storage uh, Initiative again. Uh, we were in discussions to do this previously. It, it uh, slowed down and now it's picked up again. Um, I do think that's important for the country. Um, I know Bushveld Energy is here. We are involved on the vanadium flow battery side and electrolyte production with them. Uh, not directly related to uh, battery production, but related to um, electric vehicles and the automotive sector. We are looking at uh, mine to magnet production in, um, in one of the SEZs. And then we've got an initiative uh, for, for battery grade cobalt sulfate manufacturing. Uh, so those are initiatives we're actually involved in and spending money on at the moment. Uh, we are planning a precursor project in the lithium iron um, uh, NCM, so nickel, cobalt, manganese um, sector. However, this hasn't um, begun as yet. So uh, that's what we're doing at the moment. Uh, how do we fund? We uh, look for a number of things. Uh, one is uh, we are looking for industries uh, which will grow both the South African economy and create an, a new industrialization with the economy. We do a comparative and competitive advantage analysis. Uh, when we do these, we are looking for strategic equity partners to co-fund with us. So we're very happy to do early stage studies. We're very happy to fund all the way through to commercialization. In, uh, in general, what we're looking for is a strategic equity partner, either well-established local entity or international or combination of, of both that brings technical financial uh, capability and a lot of industry experience within the value chain to bear on the initiative. Um, and then once the initiative reaches the commercial stage, we uh, are happy for both ourselves as debt financiers or other parties in the market to finance it. Uh, what's more important is that these initiatives get there. Uh, so that's the aim of the unit. It's been recently established. We do have a number of good initiatives going, but there's a lot more work to be done. And I believe with the panel that we have and the studies that we've done, we've done we can do a lot more. Thank you. So thank you very much, uh, Faisal, uh, to understand what is being done 
uh, on the financial and funding side of these projects, uh, as uh, you've probably seen from some of the questions, finance sometimes is a constraint, uh, and uh, it's good to have uh, people that are, have the country's interests at heart, uh, that, are, it, that are prepared to take the long game, uh, and the associated risks in these kind of startups. Uh, but uh, as you say, sharing of risk through equity partnership is critical and, and partnership uh, also with international players who can bring technology and experience to bear, I'm sure is also important. Uh, uh, and, and in this way, one can uh, manage the risk. Uh, and, and so that's not all in the financier's hands. Uh, but thank you indeed for your kind words. And uh, it's now my pleasure to introduce you to Mikhail uh, Nikor Marav. As I said earlier, he's the chairman of the South African Energy Storage Association, and his name has been mentioned several times uh, uh, today for, for good reason. Uh, as the uh, CEO of, of, of Bushveld Energy, a major player in the vanadium uh, and the vanadium electrolyte field. Uh, so uh, over to you, Mikhail, for your words. Thank you, Chris. Um, and I am going to focus more on kind of my, my role in uh, growing the entire sector um, as, as chair of the South African Energy Storage Association. So maybe three points that I'd like to, I'd like to make. Um, first, I, I, I really welcome this, uh, this, this, this project and really appreciate the support from the, from, from the World Bank and the, and the work done by the, the team of advisors and consultants here. Um, as, as was noted, the, the first study, I think, on the sector was what the IDC did uh, with, the, with, with working together with the USTDA um, about four, four years ago. And, and that, that kind of started um, the growth of the, of the sector. It's the first time we actually really had insights as to what was possible, and that was extremely valuable. Um, and I think that created a lot of, a lot of interest uh, and a lot of initial impetus um, in, in energy storage. So, so this is, these kind of results are extremely helpful. Um, I think as, as storage, we've actually been a bit behind uh, the, the, the other industries um, in, in clean energy, such as solar voltaics and, and wind, in terms of having information on what is the impact on GDP, what is the impact of jobs, and really, those are the th those are the kind of numbers that um, that drive uh, policy decisions. We haven't we haven't been armed with, with that type of information, and now the sector is, um, and that that really creates an opportunity to um, to actually think about which levers um, can be pulled, given that resources are limited, and it is absolutely important to increase uh, employment um, and to ensure that the transition that is happening is, is a just transition in in, in South Africa. And I, and I think some of these uh, capabilities around leapfrogging are absolutely uh, there um, as, as well. And, and one of them that I think we definitely should, should leapfrog um, compared to what some of the developed countries are doing, which is, uh, which, which is natural gas. Um, we don't need a transition fuel. We can go directly um, and, and combine what we already have in, in terms of a coal fleet um, with renewable energy and, uh, and storage is the way that we will, that South Africa can do that and thus leapfrog the need for, um, for yet another type of uh, thermal thermal technology. The second point that I would I would like to make, and I and I, and I there were some questions around the IRP, uh, and to one degree that uh, that is the limit of what the the need for for storage is. Um, and I, I would like to point out that the the front of the meter opportunity I think sometimes is understated in uh, in, in 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 studies, and and it probably is even greater than than what was dis displayed here because. The IRP is, is actually not all of the stationary storage that is needed. And this is where the opinion of SAISA and then the department um, of, um, it are actually aligned. Um, while the, there is an allocation for storage, and that was a big achievement from, from our side on the policy in, in 2019, um, it, is, it is only stationary, uh, it is only standalone storage that is, that is grid tied. That means there's actually quite a bit um, in terms of storage that is excluded from that. Specifically, sites that are co-located with the with, with, with solar um, as part of the IPP program or or, or behind behind the meter um, sites that are located with wind, and and then there's another uh, uh, kind of distributed other, other and, and and other sector um, category under the IRP where storage can also can, can also play in that. And in fact, even more recently, we have seen NURSA apply to accelerate um, the twenty. 29 allocation for storage to be brought forward because there's a realization that we actually need more more stationary storage to support the um, the power system and uh, and we've seen additional examples of this so that that you know that that was to support the escom uh, bs program 
we've seen that um, uh, all the renewable uh, projects that were bid into the risk mitigation round had uh, some type of, uh, of battery storage. Um, there were, there were you know, non, no non-battery technologies, but that was example of co-located facilities and those are not in the IRP. They don't count towards the IRP cap. So you know, I would treat those as uh, front of meter uh, installations. Um, they don't require a license because the license is already tied to, to, to the PV or the wind uh, plant. So that there's, a, there's quite a big opportunity there. And, uh, and finally, also the, um, the department has announced that their intention to come out with a, a storage dedicated um, IPP type program. Um, you know, the exact timing of that is, is unclear. We're, we're hoping it will be in, in Q1 um, of next year, but uh, I think that there's some legal challenges on existing programs, but that, that, that does include about 513 megawatts of uh, storage. Um, while the, you know, well, it is supposed to be technology agnostic, so it may not have to be batteries, but it, it may be batteries um, as, as well. So the opportunity is quite large. Um, I actually think that the South Africa market could be a top, top five, maybe even a top three uh, front of the meter market, um, at least for, for a couple of years during this, this decade, which is quite exciting. And then maybe the last point I will, I'll make just to uh, motivate that if, if any, any companies or individuals feel that their, uh, that their positions or their activities are not represented, that's what SAISA is here for. Um, we've been around for under four years at the, at the moment. Um, we've got over 70 members already. It's, uh, it's, it's, it does focus on stationary storage. We do, we do engage with the electric vehicle um, uh, industry and with the hydrogen industry. There's a lot of overlap between, between those two. Um, we're involved in the South Africa Renewable Energy Master Plan um, de development where we, you know, we still see storage as kind of being um, a second class citizen to, to some of the other technologies, but that's, um, that's, that's part of our, 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 our battle and, um, and our initiative to grow the sector. So if you if you feel that um, you know there's there's additional representation that, that you could get this is uh, you know we are a channel for that um, and it's a very inclusive organization you don't need to be an OEM you don't need to be international you don't need to be South African um, it's, it's 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 quite open we have banks we have municipalities we have students um, as members and um, and it's just a, we just want to make sure that uh, it's actually holistic representation rather than just specific um, uh, piece of the energy storage uh, industry. And with that, I'll hand it back to you, Chris. Thank you very much, Mikhail. Uh, really interesting insights there and, and, and a call uh, to the industry to get involved with SIESA as a South African Energy Storage Association, make your voice heard, participate in industry affairs and help develop this industry and grow the opportunities and the value chain in South Africa, right across the value chain from uh, mining uh, through to beneficiation, uh, manufacture, and, and, and use. Uh, so thanks for those words. Now, it's uh, reached the time now where we we're going to go into an open panel discussion, but I'm going to use my, my uh, prerogative as the moderator uh, to uh, bring forward the polls, because I, I do want to make sure we do the second poll before people start to think about leaving. Uh, so I'm going to now uh, bring up uh, the, the, the second poll. And if I may ask you, uh, Mikhail, to, to switch off your camera and your mic um, whilst I conduct the second poll. Okay, so let me just get my act together. Uh, forgive me for a second while I bring up the poll and explain it to you. So I, I'm bringing up a poll number two. Uh, we've done the first poll. And I hope everybody can see this. And again, there are two questions in this poll, and I hope we can go through this as quick as possible so that we can uh, have time uh, to, uh, to get involved in the Q&A, uh, which is an important part of this engagement. So the first question is, what are the main bottlenecks for the battery value chain development in South Africa? Uh, where do you see the bottlenecks? So please, uh, this is also a multiple choice question. Uh, so you can tick more than one uh, of the options, but please can you focus on the main bottleneck? So we, rather than just ticking every single one uh, without thinking, uh, if you can think about what are the major bottlenecks that you would like to uh, identify as holding back the battery energy value chain development in South Africa. I see uh, 
Uh, people are coming in now thick and fast uh, with uh, responses to this question. Uh, and we're going, starting to get a, a picture of the bottlenecks, uh, but let's let it proceed for a while as people uh, complete this uh, poll. Uh, really interesting uh, and, and uh, good to get your engagement as the audience. It's going to help uh, customize energy solutions in the work that they're doing in finalizing their study uh, to get an understanding of what you the key people in this industry uh, are thinking what you regard as the bottlenecks and what needs to be unlocked. So that's the first question. So while people are busy filling in the first question, I'm moving now to the second question, uh, which is a is not a multiple choice. It's a single choice. So um, uh, it's, it's what we call a radio button. So you can only pick one out of these uh, options. And the question is, what should South Africa do first? What is the one thing that we should do first to enable development of the battery storage value chain? So uh, it's not a multiple choice. It's the, 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 the most important thing that we should be doing first. Uh, and uh, people are starting to fill that in as well. It's great to see, uh, see the, the number of responses coming in thick and fast there. Um, so, uh, let's just go back to question number one, and I see oh, quite a lot of uh, people are, are, are completing the, the survey, a uh, total of uh, 250 at the moment have completed poll number two, question number one, uh, now, uh, you know, the, the results are still coming in as we speak. And I, I'm moving to question number two, yeah, I see there's about 260 people. Uh, 65 now uh, who have responded and we're starting to get a picture of uh, what you're thinking. So I'm going to let the poll run uh, for another minute or so. Um, so please, uh, ladies and gents, if you can hurry and uh, make your voice heard and complete the two questions. It's very simple and quick. Shouldn't give this a lot of thought. Um, uh, you know, your gut feeling as, as, as people who are interested in the sector uh, it counts for a lot, uh, your gut feeling, uh, because there are no strictly right or wrong answers. This is a matter of getting your opinion, getting your input uh, to this study that has been done by Customized Energy Solutions and their partners uh, in South Africa and in India. Uh, and, and really, uh, this is a kind of a collaborative process where your voice is important and, um, and, 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 and where your voice will actually be part of the finalization of this important study uh, commissioned by the uh, DMRE through uh, Mintech and, uh, and, and, and facilitated and hosted uh, by, by the World Bank, Bank who have funded the study. And I know Frederick is one of those passionate people about energy storage, not just in South Africa, not just in Southern Africa, but throughout the African continent. And he's done incredible work over the time. As, by the way, has the IDC. The IDC did this previous study that was alluded to earlier, and I was honored to be involved in helping distribute the study to a wide audience in South Africa. And at the time, uh, Bertie Stratum was leading the, the way. I know Bertie uh, you know, has since retired, but he's here today amongst the audience, and I'm hoping to hear from him a little later. Ladies and gents, I think we're kind of reaching the end of the participation. We've had a great result, 293. 295 uh, results. So I'm going to end the poll now, uh, which I've done. I'm going to share the results with you now. I hope you can see them. I hope the technology is working uh, for us, but you can see uh, in, in question number one, uh, lack of policy and regulation is highlighted as the biggest stumbling block. Lack of access to finance is the second. So I hope the IDC are taking note that the World Bank is taking note, but Close on that is that there are no specific public incentives. Right, so interesting there, we'll have to analyze this, um, but quite a, a broad spread of answers there. Uh, so it seems to be quite a lot of stumbling blocks, not just one dominant one. And on to question number two, uh, I can, it says here, what should South Africa do first? And, and I see there the top one there is incentives. We need incentives for organic, uh, organic uh, local battery companies. So uh, interesting results, uh, and I know that uh, CES are going to study them intently, as is the World Bank and as is Mintech, 
uh, to try and uh, understand uh, what, you know what what the views are of, of this audience which is not just the person in the street but expert people who have a deep interest in this uh, technology going forward okay so i'm going to stop sharing now and thank you uh, 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 ladies and gentlemen for your participation in those two polls it's been very very useful and interesting and it's now up to us to handle the Q&A. And, and this is another interesting part of the uh, proceedings today. I'm going to ask all our panelists if they would like to. Uh, I, I think best to keep your, keep your cameras off uh, for the moment in the interest of bandwidth. Uh, but when I direct a question to somebody uh, and anybody would like to pick up on that question, then please put your camera and your microphone on. Uh, so that you can handle it. And I, what I'd like to do in the first instance is to ask people uh, 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 to specifically start off with the media. Now, uh, it's not that the media are, are so special, but if there's any members of the media, please put up your hand so that you can ask your question verbally. I will see that your hand is up. Uh, I already see a hand is up, but it's not the media. But uh, Anyone in the media that would like to put up their hand, please do so, uh, so that uh, we can handle it. Now, the reason why I give special preference to the media is that they speak on behalf of the public and on the industry, so they, and they speak to a, a larger audience. Uh, so they are actually asking questions, not of their own necessarily, but they're asking questions on behalf of the public and the industry. So any media amongst you? Put up your hand right now. I don't see any at the moment, but perhaps uh, media is a little bit shy today. They're not normally shy. Uh, but anybody in the media who would like to come in here, please put up your hand and I will see you. But in the absence of that, we're going to move to Clyde, uh, Clyde Mallinson. Clyde is a colleague of mine who I've known for some years, uh, and he's really got some important things to say about battery storage uh, and uh, electricity and uh, the IRP and all these things in, in general. So, Clyde, uh, I'm going to uh, allow you to talk now. Uh, if you can switch on your microphone and ask your question. Uh, thanks very much, Chris, and thanks very much for this very interesting uh, webinar session this morning. Um, I just want to ask a question uh, around the in front of the meter utility scale storage. So I calculate that given uh, the coal fleet that's going to be scheduled to be retired, plus the coal fleet that's retiring itself without being scheduled to retire, plus the fact that we won't have Grand Inga any more coal and possibly no more gas as well, I calculate that we need about 65 gigawatt hours of utility scale storage by 2030, which actually dwarfs the amount in the study for the assumption of electric vehicles, which if I remember correctly was about 15 gigawatt hours. So I would like the panelists to, to comment on that assertion. And then also to say, did the, did the study look at any a non-chemical battery kind of storage. Uh, things like, I don't know, gravity storage, underground pumped hydro. There's a number of large-scale stationary storage technologies out there that uh, all have a role to play, given the scale of what it looks like we need. So I'd just like to inquire, either through the panel or anyone who's listening in, or, you know, are, are the other technologies that uh, could lead to local manufacture, for example, and have high percentages of local manufacture. So that's really the question. What happened and what do people feel about the scale of in front of the meter storage that I reckon we're going to need by 2030? Thank you. Thanks very much uh, for that. I think I'd like to call uh, on Dr. Oliver uh, to maybe uh, look at the first part of this question, and that is, um, uh, you know, what is the scale of battery storage we need? Uh, Clyde is saying that what is indicated in the IRP is just way, way out uh, uh, when you think about what has to be done in the future. And then we'll move on to the second part of Clyde's uh, uh, question to somebody else, and uh, about the uh, you know the other technologies, the non battery or chemical kind of technologies. But OK, um, Oliver, can you come in here? Uh, 
Um, yes, I think uh, I think I would agree, or we would agree that um, there is uh, that the growth in front of meter storage will probably be faster than we anticipate, um, if we can put it that way. And I think uh, Mikhail mentioned it as well, um, that the IRP in its current form is, is certainly inadequate, I guess, for, for, for the ambitions that we have. Um, I, I would like to hear Harsh's comment on that as well, because he is concentrated also on the, um, uh, on the market analysis. Um, but uh, in as much as the other technologies are concerned, uh, the specific focus of the study was a battery value chain um, rather than other techniques such as you, what you mentioned, pumped storage and pumping water up and down mines and uh, gravity storage and the like. Thank you uh, for that, Oliver. And uh, perhaps, um, Harsh, uh, would you like to come in here also and talk about these alternative uh, technologies other than battery storage. Uh, I know you are focused on the battery storage market, uh, but what about these things like, I, I see some really interesting stuff being talked about for example, of gravity energy storage, uh, you know, what they call like a power tower. Uh, it, it's really quite fascinating and um, uh, to, to, to see these different technologies that uh, claim uh, great things. I, I guess we've still got to see the proof of the pudding in due course. But what are your thoughts about the alternative technologies? Sure. So first of all, uh, uh, answering answering the demand part. So uh, when we say uh, electric vehicle demand is like uh, uh, five gigawatt hour or ten gigawatt hour, it, it's a per, per year demand which uh, is is going is possible. So uh, even if uh, you are having sixty gigawatt hour kind of a demand from grid. Uh, on on a horizon of ten years, uh, uh, it's still you know like a, a five to ten gigawatt hour demand per year kind of uh, uh, crosses that sixty. So uh, I think we are very clear that uh, electric vehicle industry is going to be the major driver. Uh, we might be slightly less optimistic on um, the front of the meter uh, side, and uh, our uh, as, uh, estimation was uh, that uh, the deployments by twenty thirty can can cross around 20, 25 gigawatt hour um, at, at max. Uh, and when we talk about technologies, uh, we, we tend to look the market at a short duration and long duration uh, market. So short duration market is something uh, four hours or under four hours where um, lithium ion becomes very competitive, uh, especially LFP. Uh, but uh, when, when you look at the long duration batteries, then uh, for us, uh, on, on the chemistry side, like uh, uh, the flow batteries, uh, especially VRB, uh, does quite well. And uh, uh, we, we do uh, believe that uh, gravity storage can, can be a very good uh, uh, replacement for uh, pumped hydro or uh, larger systems. And uh, uh, especially, it, it does have a, a very low uh, uh, levelized cost of storage. Uh, so we we haven't uh, uh, tried to break lot between chemistries, but when we put that numbers, others like we uh, we were looking at uh, more of long duration storage, and uh, there any anything uh, can qualify. Thanks very much uh, for that, Harsh. Uh, I see another question that I would like uh, to uh, uh, to ask uh, Bertie Stratum, uh, whose hand is up, uh, and I'm going to enable you to talk now. Um, uh, so Bertie, uh, if you can fire away with your question. Thanks, Chris. Um, I just want maybe to, to elaborate on a, on a question that I've posted into the Q&A. And I think we, we had a stage where several studies has been conducted to confirm the SA battery market within the st stationary and the automotive sectors. Um, there are already initiatives to leverage opportunities within these value chains, but I believe it's on, an, on a fragmented approach currently. Um, and as a result, we will see that within the next three to five years, based on announced tenders and projects that's in the pipeline, about 30 billion rand will leave our shores to fulfill the needs in terms of energy storage that we have at this point in time. So I think the challenge to me, and I would like the panel's comments on this is, how do we accelerate 
an integrated local industry establishment levering international partnerships to enable SA not to reinvent the wheel, but to leapfrog in this energy sector space. Um, obviously, this will require an extensive collaboration between private sector, government, but how do we accelerate this opportunity? Because if we're not gonna capitalize on this very shortly, we're gonna miss the boat. Thanks, Chris. Yeah, thanks very much for, for, for that. And I think to some extent, uh, the questions uh, are posed in the poll, uh, and we're going to see and study those results as well. But in the meantime, uh, perhaps I could ask um, uh, uh, Faisal Musa, uh, who is tasked with some of the issues here, uh, as to how do we convert talk into action? How do we drive this forward and make it happen uh, instead of talking this thing to death? Over to you, uh, Faisal. Uh, thank you, Chris. Um, and I, I agree wholeheartedly with the sentiment expressed both by Bertie and, and in some of the other Q&A uh, comments and questions that have come over. Uh, you know, we, we do have an issue um, in South Africa that we don't have a sufficiently large entrepreneurial sector. In my view, this is not an IDC view, this is my view. Um, and I do think a few brave decisions need to be taken. Uh, I think we've spoken enough, there's enough research. Uh, there are industry associations. We now need a few brave entrepreneurial decisions to be taken. Uh, I think from the IDC's perspective, uh, it would be our role to partner those entrepreneurs. Um, and these uh, need to be probably large, well-established entrepreneurs that we partner with, only because we are accessing a global supply chain and a global value chain when we do this. So I think uh, two, two pieces. One is, while there has been a lot of research conducted, I still don't think uh, anybody has, has focused enough and said, listen, with respect to all the research and all the discussions that have happened, I want to do X. And I'm willing to invest 51% in doing X, provided I have the right local partners, or I am the right local partner, and provided that I have capital partners locally, I'm willing to invest 51% in doing X and uh, make it a five-year initiative and make sure it gets off the ground. Uh, I think that's our responsibility as IDC uh, to find such partners. It's also the industry's responsibility to approach us. Mm. But I do think enough research has been done. Thanks very much, uh, Faisal, for that. Um, and I'm, I'm seeing another hand that's up uh, who I know and I would like to give the floor to, and that is Frank Major. Frank, uh, I see your hand is up. Let me just enable you to talk. And uh, if you can fire away with your question. Uh, yeah, hi, Chris. And first, uh, thanks for this very interesting webinar. Uh, it's actually, I don't have a question. I wanted to comment on uh, something that uh, Clyde mentioned earlier, maybe on uh, for with regards to gravity energy storage uh, on behalf of Les. I think he is traveling today and couldn't make this uh, webinar. Um, so I think with regards to stationary energy storage, the mechanical storage or the gravity energy storage also has a very high localization potential of even initially maybe about 80%. And I don't know if everyone is familiar with the concept. So basically we store kinetic energy at heights by moving blocks up and releasing the energy by moving them back down again. Uh, much like pump storage. Um, so there's basically a large building and uh, for example, all the structure, the steel, concrete, etc., the trolleys, the foundation, and of course the bricks itself, uh, the brick making uh, can all be done locally. And it can probably be increased to closer to about 90% uh, localization if we include all the other parts, for example, also the key electrical components, such as the uh, asynchronous motors used to lift these blocks. Um, so I think there's very high localization potential, especially if you look at um, um, implementing this in, um, in, in the 
uh, yeah, uh, in, in the areas where, uh, where it's not relevant to have a very dense uh, chemistry, um, but in, in the stationary energy storage. And it could, it could also be possible, like in their latest model, to combine this uh, mechanical storage, uh, for example, with vertical farming to use the area in between the buildings. So that could add other job opportunities. And obviously, also, there's the benefit of uh, cleaning up the environment. Uh, so there's possible waste yeah. sequestration. So you can use about 3,000 tons per megawatt hour, um, for example, of uh, even like at power stations, bottom ash uh, to... to to get rid of that. So there's a lot of, um, I think, job potential and localization potential in that yeah. technology. Frank, thank you very much for that input. I think it has, uh, you know, the, 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 we're talking about localization in this webinar. We're talking about value chain, across the value chain uh, localization. And I, I think this is something that's got to be studied really carefully uh, because I think uh, if the economics work, uh, it, 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 it certainly is, seems attractive. Anyway, thanks very much for that input, uh, Frank. Uh, I'm going, uh, Richard Helsey, I see your hand up, but I, I, I just want to move on to another issue before I come to you. Because a number of the people on the Q&A, and I'm now moving to the Q&A, and I've identified that a lot of people are talking about the environmental issues. So I, I'm just sort of looking at Nathan Fredericks. I'm looking at Zayn Selinda. I'm looking at Eugene Steenkamp. And, uh, and 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 uh, uh, you know Martin Rutter, uh, all of whom have got questions around the question of uh, the environment, the circular economy, recycling, second life batteries, uh, the environmental issues associated with mining and the damage to the environment that is done thereby, uh, the dangers of lithium iron and the disposal. Uh, how do you dispose of this? And the costs of recycling. So it's a whole big issue that a number of people have raised is the question of, uh, of the environmental issue. Now, I'd like to bring in here somebody who hasn't spoken uh, today, uh, but is one of the experts, uh, and that is uh, Avanthika. Avanthika, uh, I, I, I see you're on, on the line. Uh, Avanthika uh, uh, Sashith. Uh, I, <laughs> my tongue is having difficulty. Satish. Uh, can you come in here and give some insights onto the environmental aspects? Yeah, sure. Um, thank you. Yes, I saw that this question has been raised quite a lot, um, uh, discussing about the environmental issues. Um, on uh, first of all, with the battery uh, after it is uh, uh, after its life, uh, can it be uh, recycled? Uh, but I think on this we heard a very interesting. Uh, discussion between SE and few other authorities. So uh, where there has been an initiative which is actually taken in South Africa, where they are planning to come up with an association and charge uh, or put an additional charge uh, or uh, tax on the battery itself, uh, which will then be uh, utilized for recycling the battery after its end of life. So this will ensure that the batteries that are, if they are manufactured in South Africa, at the end of its life, it will be taken up and uh, get uh, recycled. And you know, the parts which can be reused can be uh, taken up for that. And uh, it, uh, it ensures that it doesn't end up in um, a, a waste dump uh, so that uh, the environment is safe on that aspect. However, uh, on the environmental aspects of mining, whether me, uh, um, Dr. Oliver, or uh, even Ralph should be able to answer that part of the question as to what are the environmental impacts of mining of various materials or minerals which are used for um, making the batteries. So, uh, thank, over yeah, thank, to thank you very much, Avanthika. And yeah, I, 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 I hear you about this tax on, on batteries, as it were. As, uh, you know, in the mining industry, they do such things about for reclamation, and even in the nuclear industry, uh, they well, they are all supposed to do these things. But in South Africa, I don't know what happens to the money, but it, it doesn't get used. For, it's not ring fenced and invested and safe and secure that when the time comes, that money is available. It goes into a common sort of fiscal pot, uh, and uh, when the time comes, it's not available. 
we see this in the nuclear industry with nuclear waste. We see this in the mine reclamation uh, field. So uh, there is a degree of skepticism uh, on that front. But uh, I, I think yeah, it's important to note that there is a cost involved and we need to make provision uh, of some form or another for this cost. Uh, but Dr. Oliver, why don't you come in here and also talk to the mine uh, issue uh, about how one deals with the environmental impact of uh, mining these new minerals. Well, I'm not a mining expert, but clearly the microphone, the impact... please. Yeah. it's on. It should be on. All good. Um, so I'm not a mining industry expert, I must say, but, um, you know, perhaps uh, uh, um, Dax Molefi could, could add something here from the Mintech perspective. But I mean, mining and minerals processing clearly has an environmental impact both on the, both on the environment itself um, through, you know, water usage, uh, pollution, digging great holes in the ground and the like. Um, but of course, also from an emissions point of view. And I mean, we know uh, that uh, mines should be required to rehabilitate uh, a mine, or stabilize it uh, post use or post at the end of the life of the mine, but that's often doesn't seem to be happening. Um, I also know that uh, some of the mines are actively looking at ways to, to decarbonize where they can. Um, clearly, this is often also a commercial issue and probably will be driven more by um, not just regulations, but also by the financial sector, um, because we see that in, uh, you know, some of the, the uh, comp some of the industries that are significant emitters of carbon are find, finding it increasingly difficult to access finance. And uh, so this is, this is obviously also a driver in, in, in that direction. There is some concern, of course, also about the mining activities elsewhere in Africa. Um, the DRC is an example with, with cobalt. It's, it's not an unproblematic uh, issue. Um, so yeah, it's, it's, it, it, it is an issue and, and people are looking at it at the mining industry. Um, the, uh, yeah, I think I've wanted to say something else and I've now forgotten. <laughs> <laughs> no problem. Uh, we, if you think about it, we can always come back to you. Uh, thanks, Oliver. Uh, so, uh, yeah, I, I, I see here a question um, uh, from Guy Fremantle, uh, and, and it's one that I've often asked myself and never really uh, known the, the answer, and, and that is, Look, lithium seems to be the predominant uh, chemistry uh, right now, lithium ion, and, um, and, and, and there must be massive demand for lithium, uh, you know, for these mega factories. And, my, and the question uh, from Guy Fremantle and, and myself is, uh, where's all this lithium going to come from? Uh, are, are there kind of finite reserves of lithium? Or is, 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 is the reserve so vast that we just don't even have to think about it at this stage? Um, I don't know who is the right person to ask this question, but let, let's move to somebody who hasn't spoken uh, to, uh, today uh, and uh, who's in the, the audience. And I'm looking around for Elena Broughton. Elena, tell us about lithium and, and, and is it going to be always available? Hi, Chris. Hi, everyone. Uh, um, I'll be honest with you. I think that question should be directed to Harsh. <laughs> Harsh, come on. You're going to come in here in the hot seat. <laughs> yeah, so uh, uh, this uh, lithium requirement uh, in, in lithium chemistry is, is, is not uh, that, that high. So that, that's the first part of the equation. So by, by weight, the requirement is just... Uh, uh, 3% to 4%, uh, depending upon uh, different chemistries. Uh, but again, the, I, I think the question is like, from where it's uh, got to come? So uh, we, we are seeing uh, a lot of this uh, uh, projects uh, uh, are, are being studied uh, in uh, Zimbabwe. I'm forgetting the uh, name of the mining uh, mine, but uh, uh, that, that's going to be a big resource for uh, getting uh, lithium in uh, Southern Africa. Uh, and uh, there, there is a lot of uh, lithium still available uh, for, for getting contracted in Western Australia. So the, they, they are still looking 
uh, at at a, a lot of uh, this uh, kind of quantity to be uh, uh, contracted for. Um, and we, we have seen a lot of countries in, in Europe are, are going, going to Australia uh, for getting spodumene. Um, so, yeah, I mean, it is not infinite, but it, it's not uh, that less that uh, we, we need to worry uh, in, in near future. So uh, there, are, there are different uh, sources of uh, lithium and uh, the more and more sources are getting explored. Uh, even a place like Afghanistan uh, is, is uh, said to be very rich in uh, 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 lithium mineral, which can be uh, used for uh, battery grade. Uh, there, there was where they say uh, China, China is going to invest 10 trillions in future around that. Uh, but I mean, uh, there are uh, new and new sources of lithium getting identified, uh, uh, and that, that has been done in the last five years. So. Uh, I don't think we need to worry that much. Okay, well, it's good to hear. And <laughs> you know, five you you talk in five years sort of time. Some people are talking in hundred years time. Uh, I I don't know, but it doesn't seem to be renewable. Okay, fine. Um, I just wanted to try and get an idea: is do we have a short term crisis looming? And the answer is that it seems to be not 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 really in the short term. Uh, look, we are running out of time. I, I wanted to just move uh, to. Another person who's had his hand up for some time, if I can find him. Yes, Richard Halsey. Richard, I see your hand is up. And then we're going to move uh, to Tandanai Koza. Uh, Tandanai Koza. Uh, so first of all, let's move to Richard. I've, uh, uh, I think I've enabled you, uh, Richard. Have I enabled you? Can you speak? Can you switch on your mic? Uh, hi, Chris. Yes. Can you hear me? Yes, loud and clear, thanks. All right, this is just a quick one, just to pick up on the topic of leapfrogging, which uh, Mikhail and Bertie and others have, have touched on. Uh, and the context I'm thinking of is in, in the gas to power sector, you know, we the ILP is calling for 3000 megawatts by 2030, but if you look at gas to power projects, which either already have environmental authorization or, or are trying to get environmental authorization, it's about at least 14 gigawatts, which is obviously a, a very large number and and if gas has already been out competed for bulk supply then if you're looking at these gas projects uh, for peaking or balancing and that is potentially something that batteries can do um what seems to me as a bit of a gap is it, there needs to be a convincing economic case in the public view showing how batteries either in the short or the medium term uh, offer a better sort of economic proposition to gas because with the country poised to make a massive investment in gas, sort of now is the time to show that other options might be able to do it. Mm. Um, so just uh, any, any thoughts on that or available information on that? Um, it, it seems to be the, the point where we need to be looking at it. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. Uh, 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 Elena, I don't know if you want to come in and take this one. <laughs> uh, but uh, yeah, there's often the question asked about gas as a, as a transitionary uh, fuel. And, and as, as um, Clyde Melanson pointed out earlier, that no, he says he doesn't think, uh, you know, hydrogen, uh, he doesn't think uh, natural gas, uh, you know, LNG should be a transitionary fuel at all. We can go straight. The economics are such that we should be going straight to battery storage. What is your, your thoughts on this? Microphone, please. Microphone. Uh, yeah, my apologies. Sorry, Chris, I don't want to sound uh, like I don't know anything, but this is definitely <laughs> not my area of expertise and I don't want to make it uh, to, to, to promise something or to offer an opinion that is actually not an expert opinion. So I'll take, uh, I'll, I'll take leave of that. Uh, maybe someone else on the team can, uh, can come and respond. Yeah, yeah, thanks. I, you know, I was I was trying desperately to bring the women into this conversation, uh, but I, I don't, uh, uh, you know, I, I, I wasn't quite sure of, of your specific expertise, but uh, thanks for being very frank with us. Look, it, it's it, time is marching on and I would like to make this the last question, uh, if I may, and move uh, to, uh, as I mentioned, to uh, Tandanani Koza. Uh, uh, Tandanani, uh, can you take the microphone, switch your mic on and speak? Thanks. Uh, 
Uh, are you there, uh, Tandanani? If you're not, we'll move on to another uh, another another uh, questioner. Please switch your microphone on if you're ready to ask your question. Okay, I th it, maybe he's moved out uh, already, but uh, the next question then is James Donkerman. Uh, James, I see your hand is up as well. Uh, so I'm going to allow you to talk now if you can um, uh, pose your question. Uh, hello, good morning, everybody. Good morning, uh, Chris. Thanks for this very informative uh, uh, workshop. My, my question is basically for, for every business uh, opportunity for business proposal or business you want to start, uh, there's a need for land. And as I know, we have a, a problem with land in South Africa. How are we going to address the, the land issue? Mm -hmm. And that's my question in short. Thank you. Thank you very much, James. I, I, I would like to ask anybody amongst our panel, uh, is land an issue? I, I personally wouldn't have thought so. Uh, I, th I would have thought South Africa has abundant uh, land resources. Uh, but I, I'm interested to hear what, what the panel has to say. Uh, panel, anybody wants to come in here and uh, say, is land a problem in South Africa for this industry? Chris, maybe I can come in here. <laughs> Great. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, so, so um, obviously I'm, I'm, I'm not a town planner and I'm an economist. Uh, um, and uh, um, I, can, I can mainly respond uh, uh, with respect to the potential uh, for job creation, the skills, but of, of course, when it comes to the deployment of these projects, uh, one of the factors of production is land. And uh, we need to think about wh what are we actually talking about here? Is it land uh, that we need to develop the factories? Uh, I believe that we have uh, now quite a number of uh, um, the, the economic zones that the government is currently uh, pursuing uh, where the, some of the projects can actually be located. Uh, we also have uh, uh, a number of uh, uh, reds uh, that are also being uh, um, currently investigated and uh, some of them have already been available. So as far as the manufacturing um, um, sort of value chain is concerned. Personally, I don't believe that the land is an issue. Um, the, there is plain sort of industrial land, uh, in my opinion, that can be uh, uh, perused. We have plenty of uh, mining land that's currently not utilized, uh, that could potentially be also um, um, looked at. Uh, we have uh, Escom power stations that are going to close down soon uh, where the existing infrastructure, existing facilities can be also used. And I know Escom is also looking at that. Uh, so personally, I don't think uh, for us to develop this battery value chain that uh, we should be concerned about the land. I think actually the concern that we need to, uh, uh, to, to worry about uh, besides the financials that we've spoken about, uh, uh, besides having access Access to the technology and the materials is actually really skilling people, making sure that uh, those type of uh, technologies and those type of manufacturing activities uh, can be uh, done, uh, ca can be created for the local workforce uh, and that we have the right skills. Um, thank you. Yeah, thank you very much, Elena. And uh, I think you're spot on there, in my humble opinion, not that I'm any kind of expert on this. Uh, but ladies and gentlemen, it's really now come to the official end. Uh, but I want to say that after the official end, I'm very happy to stay on another 20 minutes or half an hour even to uh, sort of engage in more discussion because there's never enough time for discussion, uh, but we're going to make time. Uh, so uh, while we're going to draw an official close to the proceedings today, uh, after that, we're going to continue until you get tired or I get tired. So uh, I would like to now uh, say it's been really interesting for me and uh, valuable and, and, uh, and, and a lot of uh, inf information that still has to be studied. But I'd like to now call on Frederick again. Uh, he did the opening words and I would like to 
ask him to make a few closing uh, comments uh, uh, before we then continue with this Q&A. So over to you, uh, Frederick, for your closing words. Thanks, Chris, and, and thank you to, to, to all the participants for the, for the very live discussion and, and, and the very interesting questions. Uh, actually, main, main takeaway from my side would be that uh, we are asking ourselves the same questions. Uh, basically, we, we, we are at the, at, the, at the stage where we, we see that there is a leapfrog, an opportunity, and then we say how to get there. Um, I'm an engineer by training, and then I can feel that uh, many of, uh, of us in the panel also, not the panel, but the participants, uh, we are really technology savvy and then, and then look at the supply aspect of things. Um, if we take the economic uh, hat, I would say that uh, maybe um, instead of asking ourselves uh, how much money would leave our shores if we don't manufacture in country? We may ask also in the other, in the other uh, scenario, how much would leave our shores if we wait for the manufacturers to be there? So there is an arbitrage to, to get, of course. Uh, you know, so, uh, the United States, which is uh, known for its uh, science of delivery, yeah? uh, that took one decade to have their, their battery value chain uh, uh, set up and it's not yet done. Uh, and it was at a time when the battery technology was costly. So now we, we have to, to think uh, differently, uh, being in our ideal position in South Africa. So from all this uh, work and all these uh, uh, great uh, questions that you asked, we, 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 we will actually uh, uh, bring all that up in the in the studies, and then and then make something that is interesting and and at the same time informative for decision makers. Uh, not provide recommendations per se, but provide the uh, directions of uh, of uh, of um, you know impact of different scenarios, and then uh, hopefully uh, the the global benchmarks that we will do also will be able to inform the decisions here in South Africa. So, so it's just the beginning on our side, uh, the World Bank, we are ready to support, of course, on the next steps. Um, our colleagues from the, the IFC is already uh, looking at opportunities with private sector. So I'm pretty sure that there will be, uh, uh, that it's just the beginning. And then um, as of a uh, timeline, uh, we, we target the first quarter of uh, 2022 to have a, 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 a report that could be disseminated after it passed all, all, the, all the different uh, 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 reviews on our side and, and then on the government side. Uh, so definitely there will be a dissemination event or more. Uh, thanks again to, to, to Molefi and, and, and the MinTech team. And we hope to, to Definitely, we took note of uh, all the opportunities, and we hope to collaborate soon on, on very concrete opportunities. Uh, I stop there, uh, and then, uh, yeah, thank you very much. Now, thank you for those words, um, Frederick. Yeah, battery storage technology really does provide some important business, manufacturing, job, and development opportunities across the value chain in mining industry and energy and transport, as we've uh, discussed uh, today. Uh, it just remains for me to thank the World Bank for hosting this event uh, and for the support they give uh, to South Africa. Uh, I'm a great believer in collaboration, uh, both collaboration internationally, uh, collaboration on the continent, in the region, a regional collaboration, as well as collaboration within South Africa. Technology partnering is absolutely critical to make a success of this, in my opinion. So uh, thanks to the World Bank, thanks to Customized Energy Solutions and their whole team, which has been assembled here today uh, to, to answer questions and to make input. Uh, thanks to Mintech, uh, you know, for its lead role, its pivotal role, uh, you know, as, the, uh, as, as appointed by the DMRE uh, to lead this uh, process of developing the value chain of battery energy storage. Thanks to the CSIR uh, for their invaluable research and, and industrialization work. And the IDC, of course, for their financial 
uh, involvement, uh, you know, as the local financial uh, development finance institution in South Africa. And, and of course, to the South African Energy Storage Association, uh, Mikhail, a big thanks for what you're doing, co coordinating this local industry. Uh, we've got a lot to learn. We can learn. We've got people like uh, Rahul and, and his team from the uh, India uh, Energy Storage Alliance and, and his connections with the Global Energy Storage Alliance. So. I, th I think there's a lot of hands that are reaching out to us. So I um, want to thank everybody in your attendance, your participation in the polls. It's going to be very interesting and valuable. And I'm going to officially close this, uh, this workshop. But as I said, we're going to continue uh, answering some questions. And I'd like to do this now much more informally. People who put questions on the Q&A, we can never get around to every one of you. But this is your opportunity. Just put your hand up. Uh, and we'll continue talking until we uh, are, are exhausted. Uh, and and uh, I know that people will have to leave, as, as some, even some of our presenters may have to leave. Uh, but let's continue this discussion. Uh, and I see already uh, some hands are up. Uh, and I want to move on to some hands that have not uh, had a chance to, uh, to speak yet. So let me uh, move to... Uh, whew, the hands are coming. Uh, Michelle Rivarola. Michelle, would you like to uh, switch on your microphone and uh, make your point? Yeah, um, I think we're concerned about what color we're going to paint the walls of our house before we even fix the cracks. So surely the first point should be, let's just fix the cracks. Let's just use stationary systems, fix our electricity supply, rely on renewables. Then we can talk about EVs and all the rest. At the moment, there is not a single motor manufacturer that manufactures engines in South Africa. Not anymore. They don't manufacture gearboxes. All the expensive components are imported. And that is for a reason. Economies of scale. So let's just fix the cracks and then worry about what color we're going to paint the walls. Yeah, thanks for, for that. And look, is there anybody on our panel that wants to come in here? He's basically saying, let's forget about, uh, you know, anything, the batteries and you know, vehicles. Yes, they can import the battery packs, whatever. We maybe should be making electric vehicles, but, but let's concentrate on getting our electricity supply sorted out. Anybody on the panel who wants to pick this up? <laughs> it's a tough one. <laughs> Yo, there we go. Frederick, you're ready for the tough action. Yeah, we we'll live soon, but uh, but just on this, uh, and it was one of the on the thinking we had when we started this study. Yeah? Um, um, you know, it's it's um, planning things does not uh, impede to 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 fix uh, the cracks. <laughs> uh, planning is long term. Planning is to have a direction. And planning is to uh, prepare policy to do investment. Obviously, there will not be any manufacture in 2022. Uh, what we are thinking is that uh, what is enabling to have manufacturing in 2030 or 2025. So let's not let's not uh, uh, mix up all the topics. Uh, the topic of energy crisis is a topic of energy crisis, and definitely this report will not address this topic. Uh, and then and then obviously, uh, you know the. the you know, I was talking about technology savvy. It's also another thing. Uh, we 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 think a lot about more energy. We don't think enough about for what. Uh, meaning, you can have more energy if you don't use it wisely. It's not going to produce any 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 wealth and any growth. Uh, South Africa has uh, an energy intensity, meaning the energy used by uh, unit of GDP. That is twice the world average. It means that we need to use energy more wisely. More energy will not solve the equation by itself. We need to have a lot of different things. And that's where the battery value chain is coming in. Uh, if, if you have a, a, a value chain that is not only serving your purpose of having more energy, but also serving the purpose of having more growth, you solve two shot two 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 things in one shot. That's that's that was the, the, the initial thinking of the study. But agree with you, Ami. Uh, there is an energy crisis to be solved. Just that it's not the purpose of this uh, report. Over. Thank you, Frederick. I think that's a you know a sound answer. 
He's not uh, suggesting that there is no energy crisis that needs to be dealt with urgently. Uh, but we also have to think medium and longer uh, term uh, about our direction. So I see another hand up from Chris Weebles. Chris, I'm going to enable you now. Uh, if you can switch your microphone on. Yes, can you hear me? Yes, loud and clear. It's actually, I don't know why it came up as Chris, it's Eric. I must check my name. Eric, I'm oh, sorry, no, no, it, it does say Eric, it's me. I'm just... Oh, uh, do I look like you. Gee, thank I'm goodness. just getting old. Um, <laughs> <laughs> just a, a question, I'm in the renewable sector. I do um, rooftop solar for small, medium enterprises. And one thing I can guarantee you is that there's massive, massive availability of capacity if there could be regulation around allowing grid hybrid grid tie systems with existing battery storage to interact with the grid, especially over peaks. And in my business alone, I have megawatt levels of power available. If there could be a way for um, you know the utility to allow peak input from battery packs, I mean that alone would be an immediate win for both the grid and the user. It would allow small and large enterprises, especially and even homes to arbitrage their batteries and my estimates are that in that case you can pay for lithium ion phosphate batteries and my business model in under three years so you're taking what is a 10-year asset and paying it off in three years why isn't this not being pursued um with vigor it, i mean this would be private capital no subsidy required at existing prices it would unlock billions of rands of private capital to give us immediate help in an energy crisis. Uh, it wouldn't require mm -hmm. subsidy. You know, it's just a simple case of, you know, in, in front of the meter, allowing grid tie over peak periods using time of use tariffs. It's, mm -hmm. it's not particularly complex. It could be done yeah. quick. Eric, I, I think you make an excellent point. Uh, you know, the, the, uh, unfortunately, regulations and policy, instead of being a leader, is sometimes a follower. Technology leads and regulations and standards and policy sometimes follows. It should, you know, you'd hope that it would be different, but sometimes that's just the way it is. But I, I think you make an excellent point. I don't know if there's anybody on the panel that would like to add uh, to what I've just said. If, if so, please just come on. Uh, otherwise, we'll move. Uh, Hosh, over to you. Yeah, I, I can just say long, long live utility, utilities, uh, you know. Uh, and maybe somebody, if there is somebody from S SCOM here, they can answer. Yeah, I don't know if there anybody. Yeah, we don't have anybody specifically from Eskom on the on the panel. Uh, but uh, and I don't think this is an Eskom issue, to be quite honest. Uh, this is a regulatory issue, policy issue. I see Oliver's uh, has come on. Uh, Oliver, what do you have to say? Um, yeah, I would just. Yeah, uh, Oliver. Sorry. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's you. I, I'm getting confused. Yeah. <laughs> no, I think I think Eric makes a makes a very good point. I, I just yeah. really want to agree with him. I think, um, you know, we have seen from uh, also the REIPPP program, for example, that uh, currently, uh, you know, the cost to government is, is minimal and is leveraging lots of uh, uh, it's crowding in lots of investments. So yes. and this could be a similar thing. Um, yeah, it's I can only agree. Uh, yeah, to the other you. question, the previous question, I just want to add something quickly. And uh, this is that uh, I, I would agree that the battery cell manufacture is, is rather questionable in South Africa, particularly in the shorter term. Um, and the reason is scale, but the reason is also, I think that uh, automotive manufacturers typically globally partner with existing cell manufacturers. So Volkswagen, for example, is partnering with LG Chem, Samsung, Samsung, SK Innovation, and CATL from China. BMW, also CATL, Mercedes-Benz, CATL, and Pharisis, uh, Opel and Vauxhall, also LG Chem and CATL. Mm -hmm. So, uh, you know, th there are these supply relationships. So it would be a similar issue to what we have uh, already in the auto industry where these tier uh, two tier tier two suppliers or tier one suppliers um, would uh, would have to set up shop here basically mm -hmm. um, and then the question is well uh, will they use will they all use similar cells and and the question may be no so and that makes the scale then even smaller if you because mm -hmm. the maximum we could accommodate is probably one plant um, but in the fullness of time, even with the stationary storage, you know, perhaps uh, cell manufacture would make sense. It's something one needs to keep an eye on. Um, and it's certainly an ambition to have and see under what circumstances um, could such a thing make sense. And that's a discussion with, with the industry. Um, 
So, but I do believe that um, that battery pack assembly for EVs could well be um, localized based on imported cells. Thanks for that, uh, Oliver. Uh, uh, I see Clyde, your hand is up, but I'm going to come back to you after the next uh, question um, uh, because you've already had a question, but we will get to you, Clyde, I promise. Uh, Chris Marie, uh, I see your hand up. Uh, please uh, switch on your mic. Hi, Chris. Uh, I just wanted to touch base on a question that was asked previously about gas being classified as a transition fuel and uh, whether, in your opinion, it's possible to skip gas uh, and go directly to a renewable, um, you know, reliant grid. Well, you've asked for my opinion. OK, no, fine. I'll give you my opinion for what it's worth. Uh, I think it's, the world has got enough gas uh, uh, you know, available at the moment in terms of existing capacity and there is a change that is happening uh, and I think for South Africa to invest in new gas infrastructure you know at the starting at the exploration level which is where we are at at the moment uh, I, I think is not the right approach um, because it's going to take a decade for this to come to fruition and by then the world will have significantly changed um, so I, I, I'm not a believer that there is a need for new gas uh, infrastructure, you know, from exploration to, to uh, drilling and extraction and, and all that goes with that. Uh, uh, and, and, you know, okay, that's my opinion, but I, I asked the same question on Tuesday to a uh, presenter on a webinar that we did on uh, boilers and, uh, and, and the power generation sector. A uh, gentleman from uh, from Sattel, uh, his name is Rightwell Lexa, and Rightwell, you know, is a senior engineer. Oops, I'm going to just switch off somebody's mic. Is Eric? Is your mic on? Please switch your mic off, Eric. Okay. Uh, so uh, I asked this question of of, of this guy from Sattel, uh, Rightwell uh, Lexa, and 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 he agreed with me. He said to be and by the way, Sattel imports. Uh, compressed natural gas from Mozambique. It's an important, uh, you know, input into their production process. And his answer was that he doesn't think that new gas uh, infrastructure and exploration of the southern uh, coast of South Africa is necessary or desirable. That's Sassel. Okay, it was his personal view, not Sassel's view, but but he's a pretty experienced guy. I don't know anybody else want to come in here on the panel about you know the role of gas as a transitionary fuel. For South Africa. I don't see any. Oh, yes, I see Frederick there. Yeah, Frederick. Yeah, it's also to say that I will have to join another meeting. But, uh, but uh, on your question, I think um, one element of response may be in the latest uh, uh, public tender that was done interestingly for different uh, technologies that were competing. Uh, I do know that uh, from the expert's point of view, it's it's uh, difficult or impossible to compare apples to apples. But because it was one of the very few uh, tenders that were where gas could compete with solar and battery, uh, I would uh, invite you to see the results of the RMI4P and then to mm -hmm. see by yourself uh, what is the competitiveness uh, of this. Um, obviously, <clears throat> sorry, it's not. Uh, it's not a pure comparison. And as I said, you cannot compare uh, these technologies like just like this, um, but it gives interesting insight. Uh, so it's online on the IPP office website. Yeah, I, I agree with you entirely, Frederick. Uh, you know, the prices all came in and around about 150, 160, 170 per kilowatt hour, you know, whether it was gas to power, whether it was uh, uh, solar and 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 and, uh, and battery storage with a little bit of diesel. Uh, it was very very similar, but with the price of of of, of LNG, what it's done in the last year <laughs> makes those gas to power projects the most expensive of the um, of, of those that were selected as preferred bidders. So I think already we're at a stage where gas 
is no longer you know necessary but that's my opinion and and it's borne out i think by what frederick has just said uh, if you look at the uh, the bids that came in on the risk mitigation ipp program the numbers kind of tell a story um okay i i see and we're going to make this the last question it's the only hand that's up oh no there's another hand that's up but let's move to clyde mallinson and then we and ranesh yours is going to be the very last question clyde uh, over to you uh, let me just um enable you thanks thanks okay, i am enabled are. chris yeah, yeah. thanks thanks so, so chris i was just going to uh, answer someone else's question if i may but then sure. you started the whole gas story and so i'm going to have to be a little bit longer than i had planned I forget short, the gentleman's Dave. first name, but it was a gentleman, Donkerman. Yes. And I think his question was misunderstood. I don't think he was asking if there's enough land available in South Africa to do uh, batteries, to do to place utility batteries, to do maybe wind and solar. I think he was looking at who owns that land. And he was looking at the whole land ownership question. And that if you wanted to plonk a utility scale battery, you've got to have a farm near an ESCOM electricity line and guess who owns the farms. So I just wanted to say that that I, I, I empathize with him in that sense. And I think it's very, very important to us to look to mechanisms whereby not only land ownership, but ownership of this new fleet that we're going to be built, building is, is enabled to as many South Africans as possible, kind of uh, uh, community ownership, if you like. So I just thought I would comment on that. And then with regard to the, the, the gas question and the risk mitigation program, I think I'm on record as having said previously that if you tweaked some of the rules of the risk mitigation RFP process, the solar, wind and storage projects could come in at well under a rand a kilowatt hour. And they basically blow the gas out of the water, so to speak even at those old lower gas prices. Um, the rules around the risk mitigation program were quite frankly irrational. And simply to not allow the project to be able to make use of the grid assets um, was almost to say, we don't have a grid in South Africa. Every project has to be a standalone. So I just want to point out that anyone looking at those numbers as, 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 as um, pointed to by Frederick uh, at the risk mitigation program should should knock about 60 to 70 percent of all of the renewable dominated projects to get a fair analysis and all that that would require is that they could interact with the existing grid assets so yeah um, from a gas to power point of view it's not even close now okay. and in five years time it, it'll be it, 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 it'll just it won't be an option yeah. thanks thanks Clyde I think that was a, a comment more than a question and I'm inclined to agree with you there uh, Clyde um, but I'm going to now take the last question and uh, Tharun Raj I'm sorry but we we're going to call it a day after I've dealt with uh, Ranesh Thakurdin uh, Ranesh, would you like to come in here once I've enabled you? Please switch your microphone on. Thanks. Hi, thanks, uh, Chris. Uh, it's a very interesting webinar. Uh, earlier, you heard from my esteemed colleague, uh, Dr. Martha. Um, so yeah, um, what I like, I just, it's more of a, a comment than a question or anything. It's uh, if you look at one of the largest batteries in the world is the uh, Vistra Moss Landing Battery in California which is actually, um, it was, well, it still is um, a natural gas powered plant. And uh, the future of it is being converted into a lithium ion battery. They have had its few uh, temperature problems, but nothing directly related to lithium ion specifically. But uh, as, a, as a project on its, on its whole, um, it looks very, very promising. and. Uh, I think this is paving the way. Um, I, I speak under correction, but it's, uh, I think it's about 560 megawatts, generating about 2,200 uh, 2, megawatt hours. So yeah, it's very impressive. And uh, yeah, I think uh, the future is definitely looking at uh, lithium ion over um, natural gas. Mm. Thanks. Uh, again, thanks for that. I think that's a comment uh, rather than a, 
question to the panel, but I, I want to give the last answer to that uh, too, Harsh, if you are there still, Harsh. Uh, any comment you'd like to make on that? Are you still around? I think Harsh has had to drop off, but ladies and gents, I think that was more uh, of a comment and a very important one too about this question about uh, uh, battery storage, uh, you know, together with renewable energy as opposed to, uh, you know, mid-merit kind of gas to power plants. So I, I, I think we're going to call it a day now. We've ha had this extended uh, discussion. It's been very, uh, very valuable. I've been, it's been a pleasure to continue this discussion because sometimes one is so pressed uh, during the webinar itself. And I do want to give as many people an opportunity to pose their questions as possible. Uh, but I don't see any other hands up at the moment. But in any case, I think we do have to close now. We're at three o'clock, which is an extra half hour over time. It's been an absolute pleasure with you. Uh, thanks to the audience for all their questions. Thanks to the presenters. Thanks to the World Bank. Thanks to Mintech and all those uh, uh, involved uh, in today's event. Um, this is not going to be the last uh, uh, workshop that we hold on, on battery storage and um, uh, Frederick has already alluded to, uh, you know, something that we want to do next year. And I certainly also uh, want to extend this to um, more than just the battery uh, side of things. Uh, there are super capacitors. There's uh, all kinds of very interesting technologies out there uh, that I think are worth exploring in the world of, of energy storage. Uh, so thanks, everybody. And uh, good afternoon and have a great day. Uh, what is left of it? All the best.